tématu ochrany osobních údajů, osobnostních práv a těch personal data and personal data rights, rights protection in the archives in international and Czech perspective. The Mr. Nikolaj Štvrtný, leading the foreign state and state and state regional archives in practice also Assistant Professor at the Department of Archival Science in Oslo Science of History Faculty and Arts, Jan Eva Gazdi Puk University in Ustina Laben. Postgraduate studies at Charles University in Theory and Methodology of History. His research focuses on archival science, theory and methodology of history, historiography, public administration and records management. Together with him, we will have Dr. Karolina. Šimungová from the National Archives. She studied law at, and history at Charles University since 2004. She has worked in the National Archives in 2013 till 2014 at the Ministry of the Interior in the Department of Archiving, Administration and Filing Service. And until since 2017, she is Senior Research Methodologist in the Department of Records Management Inspections, Department of Public Administration Records after 1992 and Electronic Records. So, Mikuláš, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Allow uh, me to take off uh, the face mask. Um, uh, uh, or rather, let me put it back on again so that I don't violate uh, the rules. Uh, we have to wear face masks at all times. Uh, I uh, will uh, slightly clash with um, uh, what has been uh, previously mentioned. I believe that post-mortem protection is vital. We need to uh, address it, but we need to discuss it and seek answers. And mine might be in slight contradiction to what Mr. Tosha said. Allow me to open some of the fundamental issues um, that I see in this field. And I would at the same time like to introduce uh, some of our distinguished guests today through ideas that they have previously published. Uh, I uh, will then also mention Professor Anton Pats before he delivers his presentation. The essential mission of archives um, and document uh, Filing service is not to only uh, collect and uh, preserve information, but also make everything accessible to the public. Archives are one of the most important places where one of the fundamental rights of citizens is fulfilled, that is the right to know or the right to access to information. Um, both the collection and um, preservation of information and opening access to them essentially uh, enter the sphere of uh, protection of personality rights, privacy, and personal data of people. Uh, so this protection is one of the key roles of archives. Uh, we uh, actually are facing a tension of paradox. So the collection and preservation of public documents and archives, uh, including a broad range of personal and sensitive data, uh, serve a whole range of public interests. On the other hand, it's a latent risk of potential misuse. So archives uh, face one fundamental question, that is how to efficiently balance the protection of personal rights, privacy, and personal data in archives with the need to open access to information documents and archives to the public. Um, from a different perspective, a uh, recommendation of the Council of Europe from the year 2000 on uh, <clears throat> the Common European Policy on Access to Archives uh, uh, actually addresses this tension. Uh, access to public archives is uh, right, uh, that's what is stated there. Uh, the Council of Europe highlights that no country may become fully democratic unless every citizen will have a chance to objectively know the fundamentals of uh, uh, history. Uh, the Council uh, of Europe um, uh, uh, expresses the tension uh, between trans 
transparency uh, and confidentiality, protection of privacy and access to historical information. Opening of public archives must not violate the protection of the private life of citizens. Uh, one of uh, our guests, Dr. Ivan Sakey, uh, 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 was uh, engaged uh, at the level of the application of this recommendation of the Council of European Archival Practice. Uh, Dr. Sakey, um, uh, works in the Vera and Donald uh, Blink and Open Society archives uh, attached to the Central European University. He lectures at the Budapest University of Technology and Economic. Uh, he specializes in uh, data protection and access to information. Uh, he cooperated with uh, Charles uh, Kachkamati, the late Charles Kachkamati. Uh, and um, uh, together with the late uh, Charles Gankamati, uh he published in 2005 uh, a major book, Access to Archives, a Handbook of Guidelines for Implementation of Recommendation uh, Number uh, 2000 on European Policy on Access to Archives. Uh, this book also served as methodological guidance for implementing this recommendation of the Council of Europe. On European policy and access to archives. Uh, a majority of uh, archival materials are related to late persons. Uh, and um, uh, then uh, uh, naturally the ratio um, uh, um, of um, uh, the information related to late persons increases over time. The uh, personal uniqueness or unique personality, if you like, does not vanish with death, uh, as uh, Dr. Shanke uh, says. Uh, so the personality uh, does not vanish when one dies. Um, and it's a question in what form it remains after death and how uh, the uh, post-mortem uh, stage protection should be implemented. Professor Anton de Bertz, uh, as Bishop Stodolka already outlined, focuses on her relationships between history, ethics uh, and other aspects, uh, speaks about respecting uh, the human humaneness uh, of um, the deceased, he uh, mentions posthumous dignity. Professor Debatz uh, touches upon the theme of post-mortem uh, personality protection post-mortem privacy uh, and uh, he uh, uh, actually formulated declaration of the responsibilities of present generations towards past generations. Posthumous dignity is not the same as the human dignity of the living, but it is still closely related. Human dignity is an appeal to respect the actual humanity of the living and the very foundation of their human rights. Posthumous dignity is an appeal to respect the past humanity of the dead and the very foundation for the responsibilities of the living. The uh, protection of privacy, including post-mortem privacy, is closely linked to one of the new rights constituted in GDPR, that is the right to be forgotten. Dr. Julia Barrera, uh, who will be guest in uh, one of our panels, um, is engaged in access to archives, data protection, and human rights in archives, both within the International Council on Archives, ICA, and uh, within the European Archives Group, attached to the EC. She was a key personality um, uh, when uh, the methodology uh, for the implementation of the GDPR in archives uh, was being implemented. Uh, so, in one of her published papers, uh, she speaks about the right to be forgotten. The enforcement of the right to be forgotten. 
preserving the integrity of archives, protecting privacy and other human rights and fundamental freedoms of data subjects, as well as the principle that archivists should promote the widest possible access to archives. Such principles can be difficult to reconcile, but it is not impossible. Stach, uh, the relationship between the right to know how free access to information, the right to be forgotten, uh, uh, brings us uh, to the relationship between memory and forgetting. Uh, this was described by yet another of our guests uh, uh, and uh, an expert on her archives uh, rights, uh, Dr. Carmen Srim. Uh, who um, has, uh, 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 who back in uh, 2019 uh, in Hazul at a meeting of Deutsche Archivtag uh, uh, says that archives uh, uh, through uh, archival appraisal uh, manage uh, and direct uh, uh, remembering and forgetting. Uh, so archives uh, are the creators of memory and forgetting. Um, archives uh, are promoters of the freedom of information whilst respecting data uh, protection. Uh, archives, among other things, uh, fulfill a stabilization function for democratic processes. Uh, this, however, is not uh, provided by projects such as Wikileaks and similar. Uh, Dr. Rem uh, highlights the democratic function of archives. Uh, uh, in conclusion, I would like to uh, mention uh, some uh, heretic thesis uh, that I consider to be truly important. Uh, so, for instance, uh, what appropriate mechanisms for the protection of personality, privacy, and personal data in the archives are available? Uh, is it regulation of public access to archives, closure periods, uh, records, destruction, or retention periods? How, uh, and that's another question, how to implement the right to be forgotten in archiving? French uh, colleagues refer to it as the temporary right to be forgotten. How do we uh, address data, the data minimization principle? Uh, mentioned by GDPR, how should we introduce post-mortem protection of personality and privacy in the field of archiving and records management? How should we test uh, uh, public interest and proportionality of uh, public interest um, in this field? Should closure periods be adapted? Should we leave the general uh, closure periods or keep just specific uh, periods for certain documents or eliminate them uh, altogether? And then, how should we uh, ensure flexibility and operability of public interest considerations in access to records and archives? Um, uh, Reducing the providing access to archives include specific access models. Another complicated question is how, if at all, uh, should we open what is referred to in the Anglo-Saxon world as privileged access to archives. Uh, we discussed this with Dr. Todd, uh, the British National Archive, on one occasion. Uh, should we um, define privileged access for certain categories of researchers or uh, to certain historical periods, events, or processes? Another question is how to um, uh, have a multi criteria assessment of requests for access to specific archives. Uh, so, for instance, purpose of the consultation, researchers' identity, have persons concerned in the archives are the issues arising here. Then, how should we assess um, uh, the introduction of professional and independent mechanisms, so for instance, accessing accessibility of archives under exemption in specific cases, extensions of closure and retention periods, inspections? Perhaps the most heretic question of all is whether we should have some contingency or crisis plans in um, the case of a significant increase in the risk of misuse of particularly uh, sensitive personal data. 
Should we perhaps have uh, some uh, tools ready uh, for additional anonymization in the archives? And last but not least, uh, should we introduce uh, an element of voluntariliness in her archiving personal data in the public interest? Um, uh, the possibility for the persons concerned to decide freely on archiving of their personal data in public interest. Um, so much from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And let me hand over to Karolina Šimunková. Good morning. Good morning. I have a very difficult task because my presentation uh, will need to be delivered in some nine minutes. So allow me to be as brief as possible. Uh, I would first and foremost like to welcome you here to this event and acquaint you uh, with um, the output of the grand project uh, under the auspices of um, uh, the Ministry of the Interior of the Czech Republic. Um, uh, I would uh, like to thank colleagues who took part in data collection that we obtained uh, during last year. Uh, so as to obtain an overview about the scope of this issue at national level. Uh, we are uh, truly grateful that colleagues helped us in the uneasy COVID times. <coughs> uh, and uh, I would also like to thank uh, colleagues from foreign archives who in the pre-COVID era uh, actually uh, were willing to have personal consultations with us, uh, colleagues from Germany, the UK and others, who were very open uh, in providing their perspective on uh, this issue. Uh, what uh, uh, did we uh, struggle with? Uh, so some fundamental issues uh, already outlined by the previous speaker. Uh, well, there are, however, practical implications and practical side to it. In the Czech Republic, we've got um, uh, rules uh, for protecting the personal data of uh, living persons, plus there are exemptions from these rules uh, that uh, apply, uh, uh, for instance, for uh, certain data from the totalitarian past, uh, all in line with the GDPR regulation mentioned here that uh, presumes personal data protection, however, uh, naturally uh, also uh, takes into consideration historical aspects and allows for exemptions so that we can address um, the infamous past. So that's the first theme. Uh, so how to balance uh, legislative uh, protection of personal data and uh, coping uh, with our totalitarian past in our case. The second uh, aspect that we address is the difference between access and, well, make, making something accessible and uh, making something public. There are unclear boundaries uh, between the two, perhaps both processes uh, may be merged together. There are some ideas about this respect, but we need to realize that these are separate processes and different. Uh, then uh, when uh, we uh, make something accessible and make something public, uh, then there is, for instance, access for uh, scientific or journalistic needs or for other needs. Then there is the digital world phenomenon that comes into play here. Uh, so uh, the NC2 access uh, uh, in uh, research premises and uh, access online. 
Another sphere of issues arises uh, uh, when we speak about anonymization or pseudonymization. Uh, naturally depending on uh, where in the process this occurs. A new phenomenon occurs and that is anonymization by design when certain information vanishes before it's stored permanently in the archives. So all that uh, we try and capture within the project and we uh, aim uh, to make some methodologies and guidelines um, uh, for um, um, uh, archives to address all these issues. And then uh, we came up with surveys, um, uh, questionnaire surveys. Uh, let me mention two of them. One was dedicated to the activities of archives. We asked colleagues to describe processes in their archives. And a second survey uh, related to uh, uh, specific archival files. Uh, so the uh, former one uh, 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 was about um, uh, the existence of internal guidelines and methodologies and personal data protection. Uh, we uh, focused on the acquisition and shredding processes. Uh, uh, then we also uh, looked at processes uh, related to the processing of uh, archival files, so what has already been obtained, whether we are aware of the existence of personal data when we process uh, archives, and how personal data protection is methodologically reflected in processing. Whether, for instance, there is uh, information in the records about the presence of personal data um, for the archival files, what uh, impact it has on further processing, digitization, etc., whether there are different processes for digital born um, documents and uh, classical analogous documents. Uh, we uh, uh, again addressed uh, anonymization uh, versus pseudonymization because the difference between the two tends to be blurred in practice. Then we looked at atypical uh, research uh, uh, requests. We asked colleagues whether they have ever faced some non standard uh, requests uh, to uh, access uh, archives. Uh, then uh, we uh, took a look at uh, uh, looking into archives and use of archives, policy of archives in this respect, whether um, uh, a need is felt for further instructions and methodologies. The second questionnaire uh, related to specific archive files uh, uh, followed up on some basic data about the archival files uh, that we already had. We focused on statutory parameters of uh, uh, making um, data accessible. We had data about categorization, and we focused again on anonymization and pseudonymization in relation to these specific files. Another um, uh, part was uh, dedicated to the purpose of uh, uh, looking into uh, the files, whether, for instance, colleagues have come across cases of misuse of uh, data from the archives, what measures have been taken. So the questionnaire surveys were aimed not only at data collection, we um, uh, looked at uh, figures, for instance, how many um, uh, times uh, pseudonymization needed to be addressed, how many times a certain document has been accessed, uh, uh, whether, for instance, a person has broader uh, rights to 
look into the documents uh, when it's in public interest or whether it's uh, for private purposes, etc. So not only these figures, but um, we also wanted to describe certain situations. We asked about historical experience and how uh, uh, archivists uh, have uh, tackled those. Part of our analysis and uh, data collection uh, was also um, uh, actually the role was played by national archives uh, and the security services archives that administers the former uh, secret police archives from the totalitarian period. We also had representatives of regional archives. Yeah, that is the state regional archives in Prague, uh, then uh, uh, in uh, Samarsk and Brno, uh, then we uh, approached colleagues from specialized archives. Uh, so, uh, for instance, um, archive of the Academy of Sciences, Prague Castle, uh, Chancellery of the President, uh, Chamber of Deputies, the Senate, uh, Czech Technical University, and Czech National Bank, and the Masaryk Institute. So, all these institutes institutions administer specific um uh, specific materials and uh, all um, were involved in this study security archives uh, um, uh, that administer um, uh, data uh, that uh, are confidential uh, were not involved. We did not believe that these needed to be uh, included in our study uh, for our purposes. Uh, one uh, municipal archive of the capital city of Prague was involved and no private archives were involved. I think that uh, 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 well, here you have um, an overview of uh, how many archives in the Czech Republic were involved. So out of all the archives, it was like 13 percent, but uh, the involved archives actually administer roughly half of all the archival files in the Czech Republic. As for the identification of archival files to be analyzed, we identified uh, uh, them based on our prior knowledge. Uh, so um, we uh, uh, know that, for instance, there are some files with uh, abundant personal data, such as census. Uh, but then we also uh, uh, know, based on personal consultation, from colleagues, what other archival files could be identified, then some parish records, etc. And we wanted um, uh, that uh, living persons' personal data uh, files uh, would be analyzed. So this is the share of the individual archives. Here you can see that the highest number of archival files uh, was provided by the Czech Technical University Archives and the State Regional Archives in Prague. However, regarding the volume, uh, scope or size, we can say, of the archive files, uh, the biggest uh, is uh, in the National Archives in Prague. As for some of the answers obtained from this survey, just uh, uh, for illustration, we, for instance, asked what researchers or researcher groups uh, may uh, want to uh, take part in misusing personal data contained in the archival files. Uh, uh, there were some common answers, for instance, that it could be the journalistic profession and that um, a researcher who is not competent enough may inadvertently publish something that shouldn't uh, be made public. Some colleagues do not see any risk whatsoever in that respect, uh, whilst other colleagues 
prvek například have, z průmyslové oblasti zneužití obchodní. Uh, for instance, in, in introduced or, or spoken of a new risk of uh, misuse of industry data, etc. Then uh, another question uh, about the future policy for uh, processing and protection of personal data that, for instance, some internal guidelines should be added uh, in line with valid legal regulations that we should uh, create a systematic uh, uh, collection of pseudonymized archives and uh, also um, uh, in all the digitization process. Um, as for uh, proposed solutions to the identified issues, uh, colleagues have mentioned that they hope that uh, future legislation will be simplified and uh, they uh, said that uh, responsibility uh, for the obtained data should be shifted to the researcher. Uh, I have got to the end of my presentation. I do apologize for um, five uh, for being five minutes over time. Thank you, Karolina Shimunkova. And uh, we do apologize for technical hiccups at the beginning. I hope that these have been solved. Since our event is being recorded, you can listen to the recording later on, even to the introduction, if you had any issues uh, listening in real time. However, now let me hand over to Mikuláš Čtvrtník, who uh, will introduce Professor Anton de Bantz from the Groningen University, who will deliver his keynote presentation um, in a short while. Uh, that will be dedicated to uh, privacy and protection of privacy in the archives. So, Mikolaj, the floor is yours. For Dr. Anton de Bets, uh, at our meeting, I am delighted uh, and very grateful to Professor uh, de Bets that he will open our meeting with his lecture titled A Human Rights View of Privacy and in the Archives, Principles, Cases, Problems. Professor uh, Anton de Bates is Professor of History, Ethics and Human Rights and Associate Professor of Contemporary History at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, Professor de Bates founded in 1995 and is coordinating the Network for Consent Historians. In his research, he focuses on the relationship between history, ethics and human rights, censorship and abuse of history, history and philosophy of history. He's author of large volume of research papers and books he published until present, as far as I know, 11 books, some of them in English and with extraordinary significance. In his book, Crimes Against History, published in 2019 by Routledge, Professor de Betz analyzes extreme forms of censorship to which history and historians have been subjected through the ages. In his another monography, Responsible History, published in 2009, by Berghahn, Professor de Betz examines the balance between the interests of destruction and preservation of dictators' archives and between disclosure and right to silence and privacy. In his very significant and famous book, Censorship of Historical Thought, a World Guide 1945 to 2000, he presents a survey of censorship in particular of historical thought in the world. This guide supplies information on the censorship of historical thought and the fate of persecuted historians in over 130 countries from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe and in the period uh, between 1945 and 2000. Uh, for the Czech historiography, it's uh, very interesting in particular that he reflects also the Czech uh, historiography and censorship of Czech historiography, for example, František Kutnár, Jaroslav Marek, which he has presented for the international audience. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Professor de Betz emphasizes also the posthumous dignity as an appeal to respect the past humanity of the dead and the very foundation for the responsibilities for the living. He proposed in this context, already mentioned, a declaration for, of the responsibilities of present generations toward past generations. He offered a set of statements that outline our responsibilities to the dead, uh, where the dead are defined as former human beings who deserve posthumous dignity, because they retain some traces of human being and personhood after they die. 
Many of the propositions Professor De Bess lays down are common principles. Historians must not lie, deny, or omit evidence, distort the truth, or indulge in unwarranted invasions of privacy. He acknowledges that, citation, the right of historians to know the truth can come into genuine conflict with their duty to respect the privacy and reputations of the dead, and urges us to weigh the benefits and harms. He claims, however, that, citation, bona fide historians respect the dignity of the dead by bringing the past to life, but leaving the dead alone. Not only for, uh, for each democratic, democratic society in general, but also specifically for archiving in public interest, we can pose a very difficult question, I think. What is the relationship between competing key democratic principles and in democratic countries also constitutional and human rights? Between the protection of sensitive data, right to privacy, right to respect for private and family life, as declared both at international and national levels, and on the other hand, the right to know, transparency, and free access to public records from which a part will once become archives and historical sources. Which role can or should play in this field the public archives? How could the archives contribute to reconciling these competing rights? What are the risks which we are facing, or we, which are facing the archives and the archivists presently and in the near future? I'm pleased to pass the word to Professor Anton de Betz. I'm looking forward to your keynote speech, and thank you very much for your willingness to open our meeting. Yes, thank you very much. Am I... Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. Then um, thank you very much. Um, my, uh, thank you for welcoming me with such kind, kind words. Uh, I'm very honored to be among you today. My talk will be about uh, privacy in the archives, of course, but seen from the perspective of human rights. And my talk is divided into three parts. A part dedicated to principles, a part dedicated to cases, and a part dedicated to problems. First, the principles. And let us start with um, the basics. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is derived from the Universal Declaration. It's Article, Article 12 of the Universal Declaration, Article 17 of the International Covenant. They stipulate that everyone has a right to privacy and reputation. And that all of us, we, have the, we need and we deserve the protection of the law against arbitrary interference with privacy and against attacks on reputation. Another article of the Universal Declaration and the International Covenant is Article 19, which stipulates that we all have a right to freedom of expression and information. And now we, in many cases, we have to balance the right to privacy on the one hand and the right to free expression on the other. It's a, clash, a classical balance between two competing rights. Just a few comments, general comments, basic comments. Privacy and reputation, Article 12 of the Universal Declaration, are personality rights. And it is essential to see that privacy encourages one's free expression once you feel safe, once your private life is protected, you have the autonomy and the strength to express yourself. So privacy goes hand in hand with your own freedom of expression. When the privacy is intruded, is invaded, this chills and stops your free expression which means that your privacy always puts a limit 
on the free expression of others. And the last basic point is that privacy also includes the protection of personal data because personal data and the protection of it is a component of privacy. A second um, of, I have, I have a set of five print, uh, uh, text with principles, the second of which is the general comment 34, a very famous general comment of the United Nations Human Rights Committee. The Human Rights Committee of the United Nations is the body that monitors the implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Do not confuse it with the, uh, uni, um, the Human Rights Council. Or do you not confuse it with the previous Human Rights Commission? That's separate. The Human Rights Committee has commented on the freedom of expression, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration. And, and it says in that comment that the freedom of expression includes the right of access to information held by public bodies, personal information and non-personal information held by public bodies, regardless of the form of that information source of that information, or important for us, the date of the information. And if you do not have access, if you are refused access to that information held by public bodies, authorities should give reasons for it, for the refusal of access. The comment also says that states are encouraged to disclose all information relevant to violations of human rights, including in military archives. And that comment also stipulates a few things about data protection. Individuals, it says, have the right to learn whether personal data are stored and what personal data are stored uh, in the files and for what purposes and which public authorities control these data and if these data are incorrect or unlawfully collected uh, one has the right to rectify okay another very leading instrument uh, human rights instrument are the impunity principles um, uh, um, published by the United Nations. And these principles govern processes of transitional justice. And five of these principles, 35 or so principles, um, speak about archives and about two components the preservation of archives and access to the archives. Not to all archives though, only archives with information about human rights violations. You, you see, I speak about the human rights view on privacy in the archives. And therefore I privilege principles that talk about uh, human rights and human rights violations. Uh, principle 15 of these impunity principles says that access to archives with information about human rights violations should be facilitated in the interest of historical research, but it is always subject to restrictions. And these restrictions are meant to safeguard privacy and security of the victims and others. And the requirements that govern these access, the regulations governing access to human rights violations archives may not be used for purposes of censorship. Principle 16 
speaks in the same vein about cooperation between archives, ports, and third commissions. And here again, the principle is that we have access to these archives, but as access is always conditional on the privacy of victims and witnesses. And only exceptionally, reasons of national security may be invoked to block access to these archives. Only very exceptional. Principle 17 uh, is this principle about specif specific measures or archives containing names. Uh, uh, it says that persons are allowed to know whether their name appears in state archives containing information about human rights violations, and they have a right to access these personal data and to reply if they are not correct. The fourth set of principles are the Tswane principles. These are global principles on national security and the right to information. This is, of course, a long way from privacy, but still its principle 10 is interesting for us today. It says that principle 10 says that information with a high presumption or with an overriding public interest in favor of disclosure are in exactly human rights violations. If we speak about human rights violations, then the standard presumption, the default assumption is open them, uh, including the identities of all the victims, so long as uh, that disclosure is consent, consistent with privacy of with the privacy of victims, of relatives, of witnesses. And the names and other personal data of these victims, relatives, and witnesses may be withheld from the, from the public if that would harm the victims. And very important, that article all also has a comment saying that many governments in the past have hidden human rights violations by abusively invoking the privacy of victims. So the privacy of victims is used as an argument not to give uh, access to these archives. I will discuss one case in, uh, in this respect later, the case of uh, Suprun versus Russia. The last um, set of principles is not the human rights set of principles, it is the famous General Data Protection Regulation of the European Union, the GDPR, which, and it has already been mentioned in this conference, in its Article 17 speaks about a right to erasure, or popularly formulated, the right to be forgotten. That is the right to have publicly available personal data erased when there is no legitimate purpose to retain them. And a few years before the GDPR was uh, approved, the European Court of Justice said that that right to freedom, to, to the right to be forgotten can be activated when the personal data have become irrelevant to the purpose. But it has been mentioned already, there is one exception or an exemption to the right to be forgotten. And that is when you further process the data for some restricted purposes, for archival purposes, for historical purposes, for statistical purposes, uh, and for purposes of scientific research. And I must say that the archivists have done a great job here because in the, in the drafts of the GDPR, 
archival purposes was not mentioned as an exemption. And it is thanks to a powerful, and, and I'm very great as an historian, I'm very grateful for it, a powerful lobby of archivists that the GDPR uh, text, the final text, has included the processing of data for archival purposes into as an exemption. There are also some important considerations related to the right to erasure and saying or to the processing of for archival purposes in the public interest because these considerations say that archiving these personal data is allowed, including to inform the public about the political behavior under former totalitarian state regimes. Next week in the Czech Republic, you have the 17th of November, the Velvet Revolution. You know very well about what I am talking including um, the, you can process um, information, personal information for archival purposes when it is about atrocity crime, about human rights violation. Again and again, this point is, is emphasized. In particular, it says about the Holocaust. And this mention of the Holocaust was the product the result of a lobbying by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Also important for us, and I will return to it at the end of my talk, you have the seven, uh, consideration 27 saying that the GDPR does not apply to deceased persons. A very important consideration, it seems to me. I come back to this. These were my principles, my human rights principles. Now I come to cases. Let us first take the preservation of personal information and later I will discuss the cases related to access. There are two famous cases, very much alike, uh, both from Romania, uh, about the preservation of personal information and on which the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg has ruled. Um, in the case of Rotaru, um, Rotaru Mr. Rotaru uh, complained that the Secret Service in Romania, the Securitate, had preserved and used personal information about his about him, and much of this was old, and some was false. And he also complained that it was not destroyed or rectified. And the European Court agreed with Rotaru and said that the Romanian law was not foreseeable and that the information on Rotaru was not legitimately preserved. And the uh, privacy of Mr. Rotaru was violated. Uh, the same, a comparable case about the Human Rights Association, the 21st of December, 1999. Uh, it also complained about the preservation of personal information obtained through surveillance. And it had been preserved for 16 years and it was no, not deleted when it was no longer needed, needed. And the court, the European Court of Human Rights agreed again. And it, it ruled that the privacy of that association uh, was violated. Now there are also cases in which individuals complained with the European Court of Human Rights that the court did not agree. For example, in the case of Brinks versus the Netherlands, and in the case, a very complicated case, of Segerstedt, Wieberg, and others versus Sweden, these individuals, Brinks, 
in Segerstedt Viburg asked to see their personal file held by the Secret Service. But they did not gain access because the Secret Service said that giving access, access would endanger national security. And the European Court agreed with the Secret Service and it also checked whether there were enough safeguards against arbitrariness. And it said, yes, there are safeguards. There is independent control on the secret service, on the security police, and therefore Brinks and Zegerstedt Wiebe do not, uh, do not have access to these files and their privacy is not violated. Slightly different is the case of Anchev versus Bulgaria, in which Anchev complained of a privacy invasion uh, because some research in the context of frustration was published. And it said that he had been a former state security service collaborator. But the court, the European court, did not agree with Anchev because um, he said that uh, um, Anchev had been given access to the archives and therefore he could contest the truth of that research publication. And he did not use that opportunity. And therefore the, his case was dismissed. In many cases, however, the European court has um, ruled differently. And when there were complaints about violation of privacy, they have in many a case uh, um, uh, sided with the applicant, with the individual who complained. And I have five rather comparable uh, cases here, uh, a case from Slovakia, two from Romania, three from Romania, and one from Poland, all these individuals, Turek, Haralambi, Tarnea, Zulk, and Tudor, they complained that they did not get access either to their personal file or to guidelines, secret guidelines, that governed these um, um, the, the use, the access of these uh, personal data. And um, in each of these five cases, the European court agreed that access was overly difficult. In the case of Turek, Turek did not gain access to a secret guidelines use, used for, for charging him that he had been an STB collaborator. And the court said the procedure was not fair. Therefore, Turek's privacy was violated. In the case of Haralambi, he did not get access to his personal file until after six years of asking, instead of the 60 days provided in the law. And the court said a violation of privacy. Jarnea said, I did not get any access to a part, a substantial part of my personal file, violation of privacy. Zulik said that he did not gain access to his file for more than 10 years. Privacy violated, according to the European Court. And Mrs. Tudor, uh, asked for access to the file of her deceased father, which was held by the Securitate, also for 10 years. That's too long, um, said the, the European Court. In all these cases, the complainants, the applicants, were given... Um, sorry, my, um, I, my presentation stopped. I have to share it again. I'm sorry.
Yes, I hope you can see it. Yes, you see it. Um, a third case, uh, a third case, one case, the United Nations Human Rights Committee, uh, the one that uh, also published the general comment on free expression, ruled in one case, Pezoldova, Pezoldova, I don't know how to pronounce it, versus Czech Republic in 2002, Miss Pezoldova had um, asked for access during 10 years to an archival file which could prove her claim that she sought restitution for property confiscated by the state. And the, human, the United Nations Human Rights Committee um, uh, sided with her and said that her right to an effective remedy and also, but that is not important here, non-discrimination was violated. So th this is a slightly different approach. The Human Rights Committee did not appeal to the right to privacy of Ms. Pesaldova, but to her right to an effective remedy. Now, uh, to compare the access to personal information with access to non-personal information and the aspect of free expression here, it is very revealing to see two path-breaking, two pioneering cases. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights um, was the first to clearly say that every individual has a right to access information held by states. In that case, Mr. Reyes in Chile had asked documents, access to documents on a deforestation project. And the, these documents were held by the public authorities. They did not give him access. And he complained with the Inter-American Court in San Jose de Costa Rica. And the court uh, ruled in favor of Reyes. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg followed that uh, ruling about Reyes versus Chile in Kennedy versus Hungary, in which Kennedy, an Hungarian historian, did not gain access to the secret security service files for over 10 years, despite the fact that an Hungarian court had ordered the security service to give access to Kennedy. And the European court following Reyes ruled that access to sources for historical research is part of the right to seek historical truth. And Kennedy's uh, right to privacy was not violated because privacy is always related to personal information. Kennedy was looking for information about other persons. Therefore, his right to freedom of expression was violated. Last year, there was another case, Gafiuk versus Romania, into which Gafiuk, a journalist, was, um, uh, had he had access to search the security archives, but that access was withdrawn because he published the personal data that he found in the security archives in his press articles. Despite regulations by the governing body, CNSAS, do not do this. And the European court said that Gafiuk was wrong and that therefore his complaint that his freedom uh, of information, of expression was violated, was not, um, was not uh, correct. Um, then we have the following. Sorry, I'm again. Finally, some authorities abusively invoke privacy. This is the case 
uh, in Suprun versus Russia, a case with, which has not yet been decided, but in which Suprun, an historian, was found guilty of using archival records about deportees in the Soviet Union uh, that he found in state archives for a memorial book. And the charge against him was that he unlawfully collected personal and family secrets of the victims without consent. And I predict, given the prehistory that I just sketched, that the European court, if it ever rules on this case that dates from 2012 already, that um, it will say that um, Suprun's freedom of expression will be violated. By the way, that um, stipulation uh, that um, the unlawful collection of personal and family secrets of the victims without their consent, that uh, um, stipulation in an order of 2006 was challenged by the NGO Memorial before the Supreme Court of Russia in 2011, but it, uh, it lost its, the case. Um, now, finally, uh, three problems. First, um, internet archives and the right to be forgotten and privacy. And when I speak about internet archives, I mean archives uh, collected by media, by newspapers and other um, uh, journalistic services. In two cases, the European Court, um, the European Court in general, tries to protect the internet archives of newspapers and other media outlets. And in two cases, it has rejected complaints by individuals to remove personal data from these internet archives. In the case of Wegrzinowski and Smolzewski versus Poland, it, um, it, uh, this was a case in which the complainants complained that a newspaper refused to remove articles from its internet archives about them, but the European court uh, did not uh, follow them. It was satisfied that the domestic court had carefully balanced privacy and free expression. And it also said that removing the, these documents, these, uh, that, that personal information would be an excessive interference into the freedom of expression of the newspaper. And uh, all the more because Wegger Zinowski in particular had not accepted an offer that the notice could be appended to the archives. A notice sighing, saying that the information about him was subject to a defamation ruling. Therefore, Wegger Zinowski's privacy was not violated. Another very famous case in Germany, in, in Germany at least, is the case of two convicted murderers who were released after having served their prison sentence and who had requested that internet archives of media anonymize all documents and photographs about their case. No, no, said um, the European court. The public interest in accessing information about the murder uh, is very important. It has, the public has an interest in accessing accurate and objective archives, archives whose integrity has not been violated. And that has a priority over the privacy of these two convicted murderers, murderers notwithstanding the fact that they have served their sentence in, in entirety. Therefore, their privacy is not violated. 
But on the other hand, when an outlet complained, the European court has been critical as well. And for example, the Times, the oldest newspaper in the world, complained uh, 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 with the European court. And it said that uh, it did not want to remove uh, articles on a money laundering scheme from its archives. And uh, it also refused uh, and for more than a year to add a notice that the man uh, that uh, had organized the money laundering scheme had sued the Times for defamation and that that case was ongoing. And the European court was very critical towards the, the Times, the newspaper. It said that internet archives are very important. Yes, that the, these articles about money laundering should not be removed from the internet archives. But it said that it was not serious that the Times had refused for more than a year to add a notice to um, to its archives saying that the information was subject to a defamation ruling. And therefore, it did not side with the Times. It did not agree that its freedom of information was violated. A second problem is the problem of uh, property. Who owns the victim-related parts of repression archives, of archives with information about human rights violations. Is these, are these victim-related parts owned by the victims? After all, much of it was confiscated by the a dictatorship, illegally confiscated. Or are these archives owned by society? with the arguments that they are from now on part of the national cultural patrimony. You, you know, the, the, the problem is that when the victims, uh, when you say that the victims own their data and you restitute, uh, you give restitution to them, you give them these items back, then the archival integrity is distorted and you hamper the treatment of repression archives as historical sources. And even if these sources are false, are corrupt, are distorted, they have a certain historical value and they merit, therefore, they merit preservation. That is the issue. I think that um, there is, a, if we strike a, a just balance here, we can find a solution. And that is, in my view, that you leave the information about the victims untouched in the archives, but that you, in return, that you give the victims solid privacy guarantees, as is prescribed by the set of human rights principles about which I talked uh, briefly. Now, my final point. That have privacy. Well, I must say that there's a very, very um, uh, special problem here because I think that the dead do not have human rights because the dead are not human beings. The dead are former human beings. They are not human beings, they are former human beings. And therefore, the dead do not have the rights of human beings. The dead do not have human rights, which does not mean that the living do not have duties towards the dead. That's something else. But the dead do not have human rights, and therefore the dead do not have a right to privacy. The dead do not have any rights, including not the right to privacy. But privacy, even if it's not the right of the dead, of diseased persons, privacy is a, char a characteristic 
of the dead. Posthumous privacy is very well existing. It exists. There is much evidence that privacy as a characteristic of the dead is, exists. All traditions in the world display basic respect for posthumous privacy. You have the oath of Hippocrates, the physician's oath, that says, the fifth, step, the fifth recital of that oath says that a physician will respect the secrets confided in her or him, even after the death of the patient. That's another piece of evidence that posthumous privacy exists. Also, when somebody dies, families have the right of, to, of custody of the dead body between the death and burial or cremation. The families can own that body for a very brief period of time. It is a quasi-right, a quasi-right of custody of the dead. Another piece of evidence that proves that posthumous privacy as a characteristic exists is seen when, when you disturb funerals. That is generally seen all over the world as an outrage. And finally, another piece of evidence is that many codes, civil codes and criminal codes in many countries of the world have provisions for responsible handling of information about the dead. Now, like any characteristic, this is not an absolute characteristic that should be maintained into eternity. Posthumous privacy is not absolute. It has to be balanced with freedom of expression. And now I have a problem to which I have no solution because the relevance of disclosing sensitive personal data of deceased private figures is low. We, we, what do we gain with disclosing uh, private information about private figures? This is completely distinct from, this, distinct from public figures, from politicians or celebrities. There, of course, the public interest in knowing these details about deceased celebrities, deceased uh, political figures is very, is very uh, considerable. But for private figures, it is low. And there are exceptions, of course, when a private figure becomes the subject of a biography or when that private figure is taken as a, as a, a typical case for a broader trend, or in contrast, as an exceptional, as an exception to a trend, then the worst, the, the, the relevance of disclosing these personal data of private figures increases. And therefore, I do not know whether the personal data of diseased private figures who have not played a public role whatsoever, a role in public whatsoever, what should we do? Um, is the standard presumption in favor of disclosure or in favor of non-disclosure of their personal data? I think that's a, an issue of debate. And with this, I, I, I finish my talk and I thank you very much for your attention. Interesting speech, wisdom and knowledge shared with us. Uh, fortunately, there are no questions from the audience. I would like to encourage uh, the viewers to use this application in the right corner of the of the screen. The, the tab questions and ask uh, the speakers marks or 
comments or questions here. There are also some questions from previous sections. Answer them to conference later, maybe at the third section. Uh, this concerning with methodology. Um, and for now, we would just have a few, few, few remarks, a few uh, thoughts that we would like to discuss with you. Uh, yes, about uh, low protection, private, about possible low protection of private and for sensitive data, about private persons. Uh, do you detect globally or geographically located in some regions uh, some significant present trends uh, in the archive policies of access to, to archives and privacy protection in the archives in international comparison? We, we, uh, but we do not hear you. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I was busy with the microphone and I could not concentrate, could, uh -huh. could not focus on your question. Could you please repeat it? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, uh, you have spoken about low protection of, uh, about possible low protection of private information and sensitive data uh, about private persons in some situations, maybe. Do you detect some uh, global trends uh, or geographically located in some regions? Uh, uh, some significant present trends uh, in the archival policies of access to archives and uh, privacy protection in the archives in international comparison. Uh, just now, actually, or in the near future, maybe, <laughs> if you expect some, yeah. some development uh, which we yeah. can expect uh, in the near future. Yeah. Um, until now, I have not seen anybody discussing this particular problem. Le let me try to summarize what is at stake once more. Um, the general division um, that European, that European Court of Human Rights and also other human rights courts make is the distinction between public figures and private figures public persons and private persons. And the, the public figures, there are two uh, types of public figures. The first type is the absolute private, the, the absolute public figure. For example, Václav Havel is an absolute public figure. Why? Because the whole world knows him. He is an absolute um, public figure. Um, for example, Obama, and also some celebrities, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, they are absolute public figures. Relative public figures are, for example, these two murderers in Germany, in the case that I discussed, they became public figures because they murdered an author, Siedlmeier, and therefore, they were private figures, but they became public by, by their conduct, a murder. They became, uh, what they had done became part of uh, the, the area that the public has a right to be informed about. This type of public figures is called um, relative public figures. And they're, perhaps they have a right at a certain moment um, in time to become anonymous again, to become completely private figures. And then the third type is the private figure. That is basically you and me, all those who are not uh, in the newspapers, who are not on television. The, most of them, we, most of us, we lead relatively anonymous lives unknown to most of the others. Okay. Um, um, there is a public figures doctrine that says that the public has a high interest in 
uh, knowing the uh, information about public figures. Absolute public figures, certainly, and also, but less certainly, the relative public figures, such as these murderers. And that the interest of the public in knowing details about completely private figures is very low. On the other hand, we have the very important argument of the passage of time. Um, what is private for me as a private figure in the year 2021 is already a little bit less private within 10 years. And after I die, 10 years after I die, 20 years after I die, 50 years after I die, the interest in keeping uh, my personal secrets secret decreases. So here there are two um, opposite tendencies at work. The, the passage of time, which works in favor of disclosure, and the low interest in the public's right to know information about completely private figures. And that's a, a, a para, uh, not a paradox, but it's a problem to which I do not have um, a, a, a solution. Because these tendencies, the passage of time and the low interest uh, for the public, yes, the public is curious, but um, the public thirst for knowledge about, um, about others is not the same as the public interest in information about others. It is a difference. Public curiosity should, should not be as assuaged at all times. And these trends are contradictory. And I, I have never seen a principle, a human rights principles, in which that contradiction is solved. Very much. Uh, thank you. And, uh, uh, and uh, I think with this, with this answer, we uh, answered also questions by Dr. Barta from Masaryk University in Brno. He asked us about time, border, timeline, connection of ethics, and problem with uh, privacy of person and future and I think you answered uh, also this question so thank you for that uh, and uh, yes, our it, session, I, session I, our time is uh, sorry uh, our time is uh, ran out so uh, I want to thank you for joining uh, the conference with us. I hope you will enjoy the rest of the, con the conference, also the next session. Thank you for, 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 uh, for, for your uh, knowledge and your uh, experience on the field of uh, history, ethics, human rights. Uh, it was a pleasure to uh, meet you and to have you here. Uh, sharing uh, your wisdom with us. So thank you, uh, and uh, thank you. now there should be a short uh, coffee break, uh, virtual coffee break, and uh, we will meet again at 11. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, after the short break, uh, we are now joining or starting the Next session, personal data in the archives, new challenges and solutions on national and European level. And I'm really glad I can welcome here today uh, three uh, experts, uh, three personalities who devoted their uh, professional career to the uh, archival theory, archival practice. Uh, I introduce the whole uh, uh, these the, the speakers, and then we can follow with uh, their introductory speeches. So, uh, first of all, I welcome Dr. Julia Borra. 
which is archivist and Africanist historian, currently in charge of archival and bibliographic uh, supervision agency for the region Calabria. She also served in the staff of the Data Protection Office of the Ministry of Culture. For over a decade, she was in charge of international relations at Italian Directorate, Directorate General of Archives. She coordinated the drafting of the European Archives Group guidelines on the implementation of the General Data Protection Regulation in the archive sector, published in 2018. Uh, then the Dr. Clemens Ram serves as Deputy President of the State Archives of Baden-Württemberg. Uh, he was, uh, since 2009, Vice Chair of Association of German Archivists. He was board member uh, for, uh, for more than uh, for, uh, 15 years. Research interests, uh, his research interests are in archival science, archival legislation, regional and church history, among others uh, publications, he was editor and co-author of Archivrecht für die Praxis, ein Handbuch, uh, so archives law for practice, a manual published in 2017. Uh, since that year, he is board member of Arbeitsgemeinschaft Orte der Demokratiegeschichte. Uh, it means working group places of the history of democracy. So, and the, uh, the last not, but not least speaker is Ivan Seke. He is social informatist and internationally known expert in the multidisciplinary fields of data protection and freedom of information. Uh, uh, host a candidacy of science in sociology, former chief counselor of the Hungarian Parliamentary Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information. Mr. Seke is presently senior research fellow and counselor at the Vera and Donald Blinken Open Society Archives at Central European University in Budapest. Uh, his research interests and publications are focused on openness secrecy, privacy, identity, surveillance and resilience, memory and forgetting, and also archivistics. So, uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really glad that we can hear, we can see each other. Uh, and uh, now I uh, would like to uh, enter an, uh, an, another phase. Uh, uh, we asked our speakers to present their thoughts uh, on, uh, on, uh, the, on uh, the questions, uh, how can we find balance between, uh, between uh, privacy and openness uh, in uh, the archives and current information society. So please, I think we, ladies first, we start with with, uh, uh, with Julia Barrera. Hello. Switch on the, uh, and now I'm, I'm going to um, share with you a, a very short PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Sorry. Okay, there we are. Uh, ah, sorry, something wrong. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the Italian solution to the problems that were raised uh, by our um, uh, um, uh, colleagues. But uh, before um, starting my presentation, please let me thank very much the organizers of this conference, which already proved to be uh, highly engaging and interesting. And I'm really, really grateful to you for this opportunity to share uh, views and ideas with such distinguished colleagues. And uh, okay, uh, the, the problems that we're tackling now are not entirely new, 
they're not only a consequence of GDPR. Uh, and in fact, we, we, we started uh, struggling with them in Italy after the uh, approval of the first Italian uh, data protection law. And in the first years, uh, we were really, we, we experienced lots of problems in reconciling uh, personal um, data protection and historical research. Um, uh, we found what I think amounts to a very good solution uh, thanks to uh, the enlightened uh, uh, guidance of the uh, data protection authority of that time, uh, and, um, um, which was headed by uh, Professor um, Stefano Rodotà, uh, who, who uh, was a, 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 a person of immense scholarship who was also uh, um, one of the promoters of uh, data protection law at the European and Italian level. And in, in short, the data protection law was modified. We will later see one of the points that was added. And then a code of conduct for archivists and historians was created. And Giovanni Buttarelli, whom some of you might have known uh, uh, when he was um, the European Data Protection Supervisor, and he passed away um, suddenly um, two years ago, uh, coordinating a working group that drafted this code, and archivists and historians participated in this working group. And I would also like to pay tribute to uh, Giovanni Buttarelli, who was also um, um, crucial in, in finding this very balanced solution to the problems we are discussing today. Um, the um, 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 well, um, let, let me tell you that um, uh, now, um, um, after the GDPR entered into force, the Thailand Code of Conduct was renamed Rules of Conduct in order to avoid confusion with the Code of Conduct under the GDPR. Uh, and, and, and it was also the text was also slightly modified in order to make it compliant with GDPR provisions. Uh, just let me inform you that we have codes of conduct also for the processing of personal data for journalistic purposes, for scientific research purposes, and statistical purposes. And uh, these codes of conduct have different um, functions to that under the GDPR. Uh, uh, um, they have a much stronger role. In fact, our data protection law uh, stipulates that compliance with the provisions set out in the rules of conduct shall be a fundamental precondition for the processing of personal data to be lawful and fair. Uh, they are co these rules of conduct are compatible uh, with the GDPR because the GDPR leaves um, some areas to the regulation by national laws. In particular, the GDPR in Article 89 talks about um, processing of personal data for archival purposes or for uh, historical research purposes um, um, that have been, uh, they're lawful if appropriate safeguards for the rights and freedoms um, of the data subjects are taken. And, 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 and in fact, these rules of conduct um, um, uh, stipulates what amount to appropriate safeguards. Uh, and also in Italy, the, the, the derogation allowed by Article 89 of the GDPR are regulated by the rules of conduct. I, I will not expand much on that because probably the provisions on these issues are, are similar uh, to those that are found in other national legislation. Uh, a key point of our data protection law that I think helps answer also to the questions that Tunde Baez was raising in the previous talk uh, is a distinction between communication of personal data and dissemination of personal data. Uh, uh, under uh, Italian law, communication means disclosing personal data to one or more identified entities. Uh, this is what we do in the reading rooms. Archivists in the reading room communicate personal data, documents containing personal data to users. Dissemination, by contrast, means 
means disclosing personal data to unidentified entities. And this is what we do or what historians do when publish um, um, personal data in a scholarly article or we publish a document or finding it on our websites and so on. Though these are all forms of dissemination of personal data. Now, communication of documents, bar keys, and dissemination are regulated by different rules, by different laws. Communication of documents by state archives or other public archives to users is regulated by a, a, a law which sets limits to the access to documents containing personal data. You know, 40 years rule, 70 years rules according to different kind of data. By contrast, dissemination of personal information contained in archival documents, either by archivists or by users, historians, and whatever, is regulated by the rules of conduct. Okay. Dissemination of personal data is subject to stricter rules than communication. What does it mean? Some personal data can be communicated by use to users, but users cannot publish them in a form that allows the identification of data subjects. In other words, users can access more personal data that they can publish. Users have the responsibility of a fair use of the personal data they can access. Okay. And this is a key point. I th think this is the crucial feature of our legislation that allows us to have a, a very liberal access policy because we place responsibility on users, on historians, on a fair use of the documents they can access. Um, uh, in the rules of conduct, we have an article in particular which I think um, um, find, uh, was able to, to, to set out a, a finely crafted balance between freedom of research on the one hand and data subjects' rights on the other hand. Uh, the, the key uh, point is users may disclose personal data if the latter are relevant and necessary for the research and do not affect the individual's dignity and privacy. Now, if you see here, we, the reference to relevance and necessary is a form of enforcing the principle of minimization of personal data stipulated by the GDPR. So it's okay to... to, to uh, and, and now I will make an, exa an example. In social history, when writing social history, many times we do not need to actually write the names of the data subjects. We can talk about uh, family history, history of, of mental illnesses, history of prostitution, uh, history of child children abandonment without giving the real names. Okay, historians need to be able to access documents in order to write about such subjects. And the documents will probably have the names of these persons, but then it would be a violation of the rules of conduct if a historian would publish the names, for instance, of prostitutes or of, of people who were um, um, locked up in a mental asylum. Uh, and then the rules of conduct reminds and, and state very clearly that the usual user's construction, user's interpretation, falls under the scope of freedom of speech and expression as a tad in the Constitution. Again, without prejudice to this data subject's rights, to privacy, to personal identity and dignity. So, uh, in other words, privacy should not be used as an exception, as, as, as a tool, as an instrument to, 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 um, um, violate individuals' freedom of expression. And then the, um, uh, there are more specific provisions 
One is that in referring to person's health, users shall refrain from publishing analytical data of exclusively clinical interest and describing the sex conduct relating to an identified and a, or identifiable living person. If we're talking about person, we're talking about living person. The private sphere of either public figures or persons who have discharged public functions shall have to be respected if the news or data are relevant with re uh, regard to their role in public life. Okay, and then the, the uh, rules of conduct also have some articles concerning archivists. Uh, and on the one hand, um, we found um, uh, some rules that are quite obvious. I mean, uh, uh, duty, um, a commitment to confidentiality or to enforce personal data protection law. Uh, and a general um, um, duty to respect rights and fundamental freedoms and dignity of the persons, um, of the data subjects. Uh, on the other hand, in the rules of conduct, we also have articles that um, uh, stipulated archives have to safeguard the integrity of archives and the authenticity of documents. Um, and also that archives um, uh, should ensure, sorry, uh, the um, widest possible access to archives and facilitate research. Okay, so um, as, as you can see, this, I think this is important that a, a, in a, 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 a rules that have been crafted together with, with the uh, under the authority of the Data Protection Authority, we um, uh, again underline that uh, we have a duty to promote access to archives. And um, I'm finished my um, short introduction and thank you very much for your attention. It's, uh, thank you. It's uh, an inspiration uh, for, uh, for example, our legislation move the burden to the users on that way. And we thought some really interesting points, for example, I, I realized that users should refra refrain from publicizing analytical data of exclusively uh, clinical interest when we speak about, for example, uh, health records, health or medical records. That's interesting, uh, interesting point. So we definitely will, will, will speak about these uh, permissions and uh, these obligations uh, discussion. Thank you for that. Uh, I would uh, now uh, invite uh, Dr. Ram uh, uh, with his thoughts about how to achieve the balance between privacy and openness of the archive, his point of view. Okay. Um... Thank you for the friendly welcome and introduction and for inv invitation to this conference. Um, I apologize my English when I prepared the section. I uh, had the experience that I didn't remember words, which I certainly learned decades before. So sorry for that. Let me start with a quote. The American archivist at the National Archive, Elsie Freeman Finch, prefaced in 1994 her book, uh, Advocating Archives, with the motto, we acquire, preserve, and maintain archives so that they will be used by anyone who seeks to use them for whatever reason. And she emphasizes with bold letters the main aim of archives so that they will be used. Archives which are not used are dead archives, in fact, without sense. In the last 10 up to 20 years, it became more and more evident that archives have an important task in our society. They are part and essential factor of our democracy. On the one hand, the documents of the history of human rights, development of democracy and the rule of law, people's commitment, their failures and victories are secured in the magazines of our archives, important for historical, political education. 
On the other hand, and that's more, even more important, these archives create transparency by releasing their documents for use. Here, it can be determined which person is responsible for which development and decision. With their documents, independent archives makes it possible to monitor political processes in the democratic state. Archives, therefore, are indispensable. This, is, uh, this requires a legal framework. At the European level, it's a, a mentioned uh, general data protection regulation, and I'm very happy about it. You may ask why it's about the right to be forgotten. But if you write this regulation carefully, you will find within the regulation what I say a right of memory. Um, two short points. Uh, the consideration number 158, it was mentioned yet, and I will read it, I quote, public authorities or public or private bodies that hold records of public interest should be services with pursuant to union or member state law have a legal obligation, I repeat, a legal obligation to acquire, preserve, appraise, arrange, describe, communicate, promote, disseminate, and provide access to record of enduring value for general public interest. And this list of verbs corresponds to the verbs used in our archive laws to describe our archival work. Furthermore, there is a provision that archives process and store personal data. And within the Article 17, which is a central article right of erasure, which means the right to be forgotten, is a paragraph three. All these obligations to lead information in paragraph one and two, I quote, shall not apply to the extent, extent that processing is necessary for archival purposes in public interest. The privileged status of archives is rounded off uh, in Article 89, Julia Baratta just told. Here is it made possible that in archives, the right of those who are affected can be restricted or abolished. Otherwise, the archives would not longer be able to fulfill their tasks. The European framework, in my opinion, is on the whole sufficient. And in Germany, it is accomplished by federal law and regional archive laws. And these laws, were established in 1987, 88, and following years. And it, they have been the first data protection laws ever in Germany. So we say archival laws are the first data protection laws we have had. And with a um, data protection regulation of the European Union, in my opinion, archives are now better privileged than before. However, we need to discuss how to implement the framework in our daily work. Everything fine? No, not really. We have heard, and Anton, I think, mentioned it, of administrations which look to paragraph one and two of article 17 only and erase documents without offering them before to the archives. In these cases, the documents and our heritage are ruined, and the possibility of democratic control in the archives is undermined. When we talk on access, we have to discuss appraisal as well. On the one hand, we need more communication with our administrations, with documents we have in our archival processes. But we should think too to include the society in our, in our appraisal decision during appraisal processes. The society should have the opinion to make proposals 
suggestions, which records should get into the archives and which can be deleted. You may ask users, researchers, groups who have close connection to the subject, but the archivist retains the final decision. But if we discuss appraisal, the relevance of archives become more visible. It will be easier to explain the role of archives in the democratic state. And so we get back to the access. And a few sentences to the access in Germany. We have 17 archival laws dependent on a federal law and for each country as a Bundesland. And um, the first essential piece of information is that access to archival records is basically regulated in archival laws. There's a strict distinction between administration records and records and information in archives. After this, after this decision that a file is a key archival material, it's no longer subject to administration's regulations. That means processing, communication, dissemination is always uh, in archival laws. And if, that's important too, an information in the administration has to be destroyed for reason of data protection, the accession in the archival font replaces the obligation to destroy. We call it Löschungssurgat, deletion surrogate, archiving means a delete. And after this moment, everything is only in archival regulations. The basic principle is in our access, everyone can use the records and have a view to the files. And if a wish has to be, deni to be denied, the archives have to explain it with a good reason. And if the citizens don't expect the decision of the archive, they can go to court and ask for a court ruling. A record without an information which con concern personal data includes secrets, secrets protected by law or disturbed copyright can be used after 30 years. And then we have additional deadlines, a record which concern a person, for example, a personal file or court record can be used after 10 years, 10 years after the death of person. The date is unknown. We just take 100 after the birth. And if both isn't uh, known, we have 60 years after uh, the closing of the record. It depends on, on the Bundesland, but these are the main deadlines we have in nearly all Bundesländer, in all laws. And uh, that sounds uh, very restrictive, but all archival laws in Germany know the shortening of deadlines so that users can read the records before for their purposes. And the regulations of shortening or abbreviation of deadlines are part of the archival laws. As first, at first, we distinguish between personal files and subject files. And therefore, we are asking for the reason of the ex existence of the record. You may take, for example, a building application. You will find the name of the person who wants to build a house, the name of the architect, the neighbor, who perhaps was not pleased. All these are personal data. But the reason for the existence of the record and for the access in the archive is the building and will be the building in 50 years. So these records, which include personal data, are not are called subject files and they don't are under regulation of shortening. So we have the personal data, personal files, and for these, we can shorten the deadlines. And then we ask for the purpose. And the main purpose 
we shorten is um, research. And for example, it's not a research pro a project if you want to know whether the neighbor who has been absent for a long time was in prison or in a pre uh, psychiatric uh, institution. But what is science? And who is allowed to use these records when, they are, when the uh, deadline is shortened? Fortunately, the um, Supreme Federal Constitutional Court in Germany has defined what the core of science is. And I quote, science is in terms of content and form a serious planned attempt to ascertain the truth. So we have to ask for questioning and scientific method. We have heard it today, archivists aren't any, uh, are not censors. We don't distinguish between a professional historian who has an universe, university degree, a hobby historian, a genealogist, or a pupil who is working for a historic, history competition. We make no regulations how to present these scientific results. Maybe a book, a podcast, press conference, or a film. The shortening is only dependent on data, which means the information to protect and on the purpose. We have conditions, obligations that, have, that must be fulfilled dependent on this. For example, in a criminal file, the user may not use information of the wife of the offender because she was uninvolved. But that's the same uh, what you just talked about Italy. We have conditions and we make it as a burden to the user. He has to sign that he will fulfill these obligations and then he can more read than he can publish. That's our way to open the records without violation of data protection. We have a clear legal construction and um, my point is always to encourage uh, the archivists to find ways uh, to open the data, but they always have to look that there will be no misuse. They are not responsible for the misuse if it happens, but they should look for ways that the users have this responsibility and we have got this way. So we have had, when I remember in our reading rooms, and I have looked back over decades, no data protection accidents or, or violations. So every user knows if he violates data protection of, of anyone, he never will see the next record. So it's in their own interest to be carefully and not, um, they may be curious in the record, but not um, to publish everything what they have read. That's our way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your introductory speech and for your uh, your, your emphasize your emphasizing uh, as you emphasize as you are emphasizing the democratic role of the of the archives. Uh, every politician should hear that. Uh, and uh, also a uh, production to various uh, categories, such as access policy in German archives. Definitely touch it later in the discussion, but thank you, thank you for Speech. And uh, Dr. Seke, uh, your your uh, thoughts about uh, how to achieve this this balance between between uh, openness and privacy. Thank you for the introduction, and I also highly appreciate Dr. Chvertnik's um, 
research he did in the previous work of the speakers at the beginning. Six to eight minutes, as we were advised to keep our, our short presentation, is, uh, is too short. Uh, it's very short indeed to present someone's uh, approach in the subject. Therefore, I will make six to eight simple points without detailed explanation, but I'm open to discuss them later. So first, I'm convinced that protection of personal data on the one hand and providing openness of archives on the other hand is not a zero sum game. Therefore, balancing is not the right expression because it suggests a trade off model where increasing the realization of one right or demand presupposes the waiving of a competing right or demand. Both rights are fundamental and we need to find solutions where both can be realized. It's easier to say than realize, but as, as the main idea. Second, for those whom, for whom access is the main rule, for example, historians, journalists, or open archive institutions, privacy and data protection is the exception, the restrict, restricting condition. For those who regard privacy and data protection as the main rule, for example, the data subjects and their families, access is the exception, the restricting factor. We know that there exist archival institutions for whom privacy is sometimes but an excuse for withholding documents which they find politically risky or simply want to be on the safe side. And we also know that there are cases when the archivist provides access to otherwise restricted material to certain trustful researchers under the condition that he or she will not publish the data in a personally identifiable form. One thing is sure, we can never be perfectly neutral and coherent, unfortunately. Third, as we all know, national legislation attempts to restrict access to documents containing personal data for certain defined period. Now I just heard from Dr. Rem that in Germany is 10 years after the death of the person. If we don't know whether she is alive or not, it's 100 years uh, from the date of birth. And if we don't know it either, then it's 60 years as I, uh, as I recorded it correctly. In Hungary, it's 30 years after the death and so on, but, but there are some uh, deadlines. Um, but these restrictions uh, period are generally too long for the, for the researchers. There is another well-known legal solution, the general closure period, that is usually, not always, 30 years uh, in Europe from the transfer of the documents to the archival institutions. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Czwartnik uh, talked about the Handbook on Access to Archives. This is how it looks like in English edition. There is a French edition too, in which you can find colorful maps uh, where you can check the different uh, general restriction period. These are not the same. Uh, the good news is that the Council of Europe uh, realized that it's uh, almost 20 years old and they want to start a new kind of survey to, to see the status of implementation of the recommendation on a European policy on access to archive. As we all know, so if you will be receiving uh, Surveys, I know we have too many surveys, but uh, in that case, please respond. Fourth, observing the archives acts, acts only is not enough in most cases. Uh, you are fortunate uh, in Germany or in other countries where you can read everything out from the archives act. But in general, I think you need to take the data protection acts, the freedom of information acts and other acts and regulation in national law into consideration, including international documents like GDPR, and interpret these jointly. Legal coherence is very important here so that the archivist may not decide arbitrarily in giving or restricting access. Fifth, the archivist may think that <clears throat> she is able to make uniform decisions based on simple rules, as uh, Mr. Dolezal um, <clears throat> emphasized in his introductory speech that, uh, or note, that uh, rules should be very simple. But in practice, it's not the case. Many aspects and conditions have to be taken into consideration, sometimes uh, enacted in, in legal documents, sometimes not. Sometimes you can extract it from existing 
uh, laws and regulation. Let me enlist just a few basic ones. The original consent of the data subject, whether she consented to the future public availability of her data. The donor's wish, who is not necessarily the data subject, as included in the deed of gift or deposit agreement. Whether the personal data uh, were created as part of a public function, you, uh, you uh, touched, uh, several of you uh, were touching this, this question, but I think the, the central element is not the public figure as such, but the public activity and whether the data were created during this kind of uh, fulfilling the public function. And the same is uh, true vice versa when a public figure has private data uh, in, the, in the documents. Whether the document or the personal data in the document has already been lawfully published, lawfully, not stolen and published, lawfully published, that means that there is no reason to keep it secret or restricted if it's already out there, but it's difficult to check how it is. Whether the personal data has been made public by the force of law, such as the data of former secret agents in countries of the former Soviet bloc, this is our, our countries. Whether the document or data has been classified as secret, irrespective of whether it's personal or not, it's very rare because the classifiers generally don't trust the, the archives on that state. Uh, and whether the anonymized data can be easily combined and de-anonymized or re-identified, that's the same, especially in online environment. So if you want to be honest, law does not solve every problem. The archivist has no time and energy to investigate each and every questionable case. Therefore, we need to use our sense for ethics and imagination. Maybe it doesn't sound well, in the, in, the, in the legal environment, but in practice, that, that's reality. Six, and it will be not very long. This conference focuses on uh, problems of access to documents containing personal data. But some of you, including Dr. Barrera, <clears throat> mentioned uh, that uh, there are also questions of rectification or deletion. In my opinion, we can distinguish two types of archives in an informal sense. It's informal, absolutely. Administrative archives and historical archives. You can say that every archive is historical because it's a, it's a memory institution. Yes, it's true, but an administrative archive, for example, an archive of a public authority, are responsible for the content of the documents in their custody. And they can even issue certificates about this. While uh, historical archives are not responsible for the truth content of the document, but they are responsible for the integrity of the document. It means that if a document is full of lies, the historical archive is obliged to preserve it without any correction. And finally, uh, there exist some practical solutions for which you don't need to change the law or the regulation or the code of conduct, just apply it within your archive or institution. And finally, I would like to add some simple solutions we try to use in the practice of the Open Society Archive. They may sound trivial, but uh, in, in practice, it's not always that tri trivial. First, we need to clarify in-house what we mean as personal data, not only users, but sometimes archivists themselves. They think, they tend to think that personal data are identifier data only, like names and ID numbers. Or that names are not personal data, that, that's just names. Or only intimate or sensitive data are personal data. We know that it's, it's not, not the case. We also need to clarify in-house, where are the borderlines of the connection between the identified or identifiable person and the data? Because if every data can be connected with the living person one way or another, then all data in the archive or in the whole world should be regarded as personal that would lead to absurdity. So we need to de define the borderline. Next, if we are ready, we need to make an inventory of documents in the archive containing personal data. 
However, inventorying the whole archival holding is unrealistic. Therefore, let us segment our holdings into parts that are out of questions regarding the use of personal data, two old documents or press clippings or something like that. And deal <clears throat> only with the rest where there might be such data or document. Now let us label the containers of the remaining part in the paper-based environment, let's say putting, that's our practice, putting a yellow sticker <clears throat> on the boxes in the digital environment, adding a digital label to the file. If a researcher wants to have access to these labeled documents, let's don't give it to him automatically. First, check the content and decide if it contains personal data and if it can be accessed by the researcher. If the physical or digital container does not contain personal data at all, or all personal data are freely accessible, give it to the requester and change the yellow label to green label, or modify the digital label accordingly. This ensures that next time you don't need to evaluate the content of the container, whatever it means, again. But if the physical or digital container does contain personal data that should be restricted, take these documents out from the container or sanitize the document and provide access to the container this way. Change the yellow label to a red label or modify the digital label accordingly, indicating that the container should be checked and certain documents removed or sanitized. I know that these are not uh, legal solutions, but practical ones, but still uh, they can make the archivist's life uh, easy. And I stop here and give the floor back to, to the moderator. Thank you very much okay, for your very interesting. Um, it's very interesting that the archivist, uh, and I should confirm it, that the archivist uh, should have some sense of ethics. Uh, it's not possible to create uh, in detail each individual request for communication to archives. But let us uh, open our discussions with with first a um, little bit planned question uh, for, for all uh, us. Do you see a need for a change in the current approach at the level national archival systems or regulations uh, at European level? Actually? for the near future? Maybe we can uh, start uh, uh, with uh, Italy and Dr. Ka Dr. Giulia Barrera, if you please. Uh, Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, do, do, are you saying uh, whether do, we think uh -huh. that there's going to be a change in the European regulation? Yes, uh, or at the national level, uh, if if you see a need to change uh, the current uh, legislative environment uh, in Italy or uh, on a European uh, level, you have participated uh, in, on, in the work of uh, European Archives Group, mm -hmm. maybe you have some um, bigger international um, comparison uh, and you know, maybe you know yeah. uh, the actual state in, in other, mm -hmm. other states of, uh, in, in, the, in the European Union. Um, well, uh, personally, I don't think that we have such a big need for a change in, uh, at the national level because, uh, as I mentioned, I think that the, the solution that was found in Italy with the use of these rules of conduct is pretty good. Uh, it really meets uh, both archivists and historians' needs. And at the European level, uh, I'm sure that the GDPR uh, cannot be changed for a long time. I mean, it took such a, a complicated negotiation to achieve it that I do not see possibility of changing it uh, in a foreseeable future. Uh, I think that the... Um, um, a definition of archiving purposes in the public interest is uh, a bit too obscure and unnecessarily contorted. Um, I would have liked to have a, a, a different definition there uh, that would help us also to preserve um, 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 archives uh, 
of historical relevance produced by um, private entities, for instance, uh, business records that have historical value, but that I understand it would, might have opened the doors to abuse, so it's a difficult um, issue. Uh, there's something we might discuss, but as I say, I do not see any possibility that the GDPR can be uh, uh, improved to, to better meet uh, archivists and historians' need in a foreseeable future. Yes, and uh, Dr. Ram, I remember you said if we solve uh, all problems uh, in Germany, no, <laughs> uh, so, so remember that. Uh, and okay. Uh, okay. Uh, do you do you foresee any changes? Because I, I know there was a implementation of, of GDPR in German federal legislation, and uh, do you see okay. a need for changes uh, as uh, some local or, or uh, archival laws of of uh, the, the countries, uh, Bundesland, uh, okay. Länder? Okay. Uh, were, were, uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Was was trying to to comply with with the GDPR and others are a little bit too, okay. uh, hasn't changed. So do do you see any any need for change in legislation in Germany? Okay, okay. Um, let me say it in, in in two steps. One on the European level. I agree to Julia Barretta, we won't get a change in a, in a few years. Or, and the only thing which for me is not sufficient is uh, the definition of uh, archives of public interest. The, this is a term which is new. And um, we have two possibilities. Uh, if you look to Austria, you have in the uh, data protection law the possibility that you can apply to become an archive in this way, and then it will be a decision. You are an archive of public interest, and you get the privileges of the data protection rules of UP, also GDPR. But who decides it? The archivists? as a professionals or data protection officers. That's not um, clear. It's in the data protection law in, in Austria, so not the way I, pref I would prefer. We have said in Germany in the comments of the GDPR, you need as an archive of public interest open access for users and everyone is, um, has the same rights. You need regulations which um, accept the points of the GDPR. Um, and um, so we have archives of uh, noble families which can be archives of public interest. We have archives of um, industrial companies like Bosch or Mercedes or Volkswagen, who have an archive which is in public interest. So that's one point, the definition and how to become an archive of public interest. Not really clear. It's different in Europe. And in Germany, we have um, in every land, Bundesland, every country, we have... Um, um, regulation that the Article 89 uh, is adapted for the region, either in the archival law or in the uh, data protection law of the land. And we have it in the data protection uh, federal law. So uh, we have only the need that these regulations are 16 or 17, if you will, uh, if you say, slightly different. So not every um, thing what is um, in Baden-Württemberg 
used to the uh, we can do with the user you can do in Brandenburg or Bavaria or so on. So it's a little bit different and we should come to to homogenize these laws within Germany. But um, I think with our laws we are able to work sufficient and have a method for the balancing between um, uh, data protection on the one hand and the access on the other. And uh, from the points which are main mentioned, um, I would like uh, to discuss uh, perhaps a little bit of the Sedelmeier uh, case because it's a problem which information is accessible in the internet. And that means which information can we present in the internet um, without getting uh, in a situation of violation of data protection. Because uh, it's not so easy um, as it was told in the first um, speech. The Bild Zeitung, famous uh, newspaper in Germany, has mentioned in 2015 the names of the murderers of Sedelmeier, and it was said they don't have, they are not allowed to mention the name um, because these murderers uh, should have get a chance um, of resocialization. So it's not, uh, not such clear uh, what does it mean? Don't, uh, are you allowed to hold a name in an internet archive or in a, a system of our archives where you can find the name? Uh, let me pass the word now uh, to Dr. Seke for his reply. Yes, um, <clears throat> you must know that I'm from a private archive, an archive which is part of a private university. So we are not obliged to follow the, the uh, operational rules of public archives. Of course, we must uh, observe the laws and uh, the higher level legal documents. So from my position, I would increase the education in archives within the existing set of rules, including ethical considerations. Because sometimes the rules are clear, but the but the implementation of the rules are not that clear. And there are different traditions, archival traditions, folklores, so to say, in archives. And that, uh, that, uh, that has a high impact on, uh, on, on the users and the availability. Uh, the only place where I can, I can see some need for, for change uh, in, uh, in the legal environment is um, specif specific rules for digital or digitized or born digital documents and digital access. Digital access is somewhat different. And um, Dr. Rem just said that, uh, that posting something on the internet is, is very different uh, from distributing the information uh, through, through traditional means. I'm absolutely convinced that uh, publicity or secrecy is not a binary thing, that even if secrets uh, available to no one or to everyone, because the medium itself uh, has, a, has a different uh, impact on, on the users. So um, this case, the Zedomeyer case, is, is partly uh, about this. Um, I would also... Uh, from my position, it's easy to say, I would also like to see uniform access uh, laws or access rules, at least in a country. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about federal countries like Germany, but you are not the only one. Switzerland has, I don't know how many, 27 or how many cantons, absolutely different access rules. So if a researcher wants to go to different archives in Basel or in other, other cities, uh, he or she will face very different uh, um, accessibility rules. So at least that should be harmonized uh, somehow. And even if the, the researcher will not go uh, directly physically to the archives, but wants to, to look it on the internet, so to say, as we used to say, the, the website or, or the other the catalog of the institution, uh, he or she will face very different rules. So that's, a, that's an area, two areas, 
the special rules for the digital access and uniform access laws, at least in, in the same country. Just uh, one more thing, uh, as the, um, as the uh, COVID pandemic um, grew and the restrictions also grew, were, uh, were growing uh, in the last uh, two years, let's say, we at the, in the Open Society Archives, we introduced a sort of virtual research room. So we wanted to distinguish between documents and information in the documents. We, we are talking about data, but data are generally in documents, in traditional or non-traditional documents. So which uh, uh, can be researched, which can be observed only only within the research room under the supervision of the of the archivist, the reference archivist. But now they couldn't come uh, to the archive, the research room, because the archive, the building was closed. So we introduced this kind of what we call OSA research cloud, and it can be a solution that uh, researchers can register remotely. Uh, similarly, when uh, when they go to the research room and show their cards. They do it uh, remotely, and it's of course, of course you can you can cheat, of course, and uh, and you can break every rule, such as the the people can make photographs uh, secretly in the research room. So it's possible, but it's still a, a usable solution for remote access, but still keeping the these two phases of communication and dissemination. And they also need to sign virtually or physically when they are still in the research room, a kind of uh, researcher statement when they, when they sign the statement that they are aware of their legal and ethical responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a solution for the, for the pandemic world. Very much. Okay. You have uh, you have spoken about dig digital access and digital archives also. Uh, what do you think about uh, about the growing risks uh, or hypothetical risks of data de-anonymization and re-identification in this respect? Uh, we are facing um, an increasing number of uh, of the cases of proved possibilities of uh, data de-anonymization. What does it mean for archives? For that, what, does mean, what does it mean for public or also pub private archives? Maybe uh, Dr. Julia Barrera uh, now is the first speaker. Okay, I, I will give you an example of what we did uh, with a. A website. Okay, we um, um, in Italy, uh, um, Peter Cash uh, administration did a, a great work on the archives of um, psychiatric hospitals, you know, mental asylums. Uh, so we are talking of highly sensitive records, which are closed uh, for 70 years. Um, but then, even uh, when they become open, as I said before, it doesn't mean that they can be freely disseminated. Um, so at the national level, we created a web portal uh, concerning the archives of psychiatric hospitals, uh, which includes a database, database of personal files. Now, we not only removed the personal names, replacing with them uh, with the initials, but also the municipality, because some municipalities are very small. So, uh, you know, in a municipality of 1,000 persons, uh, uh, you know, the initials might be sufficient to uh, re-identify someone. So that's, you know, a kind of solution we, we figured out. Uh, then, um, um, if I uh, may add something else, to answer a problem that was raised before, who decides the, 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 the private archives is of historical value. Now, under uh, Italian uh, uh, cultural heritage law, we have in Italy some um, archival agencies, like the office that I'm currently heading, which have, uh, among other functions, the uh, authority to declare a private archive to be of special historical value. So mm -hmm. that if 
uh, and then uh, under our data protection law, if uh, an archive has been declared of a special historical value by this uh, uh, archival agency, then falls under the definition of archiving um, 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 purposes in the public interest. Uh, but okay, there are still many uh, archives, um, uh, private archives that have not been declared also because it takes some time for you know an archive to 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 get um, how can I say um, uh, um, to become old enough and relevant enough and then so we might have a, a, a gap be between you know period of creation of current archive and the period when archive uh, becomes of special historical value uh, but then uh, um, our rules of conduct allows for private entities to uh, spontaneously commit to observe the rules of conduct for archivists and historians that I've described uh, very shortly before. And also another element uh, that our data protection authority uh, deems very important uh, in order to evaluate the legitimacy of preserving archives is whether the private institution has adopted a retention scheme, uh, you know, a, 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 a retention plan. And, and so, uh, you know, and therefore uh, the, the documents that a private history, uh, you know, private entity, let's say um, a private company that created a historical archive um, uh, to be th this considered legitimate should have, you know, adopted a retention plan selected only, you know, uh, the, with the with the participation of our, you know, of company archivists, uh, you know, selected only documents that are considered worth uh, of permanent preservation, and then uh, commit voluntarily to respect the code of conduct. In this case, our data protection authority, you know, would consider this to be, you know, uh, uh, you know. By and large, you know, uh, an acceptable uh, an acceptable behavior. I don't know if that helps, um, if, if I, you know, to understand the kind of strategy. Uh, then, re regarding um, right to be forgotten uh, and what was mentioned before, I would have lots of things to say, but you know, I, maybe maybe later on in the discussion. <laughs> Let me pass the word to uh, Dr. Clemens Rem for his uh, mm, reply. Okay. If Okay. Uh, uh, two points. Um, I think uh, a virtual research room um, will be the research room of the future, and um, we need exact um, construction so that we can minimize the misuse. Of, of it because it's um, you don't know who is sitting on the other hand uh, on on the TV sh um, and so we are working on it and we have started working it, on it um, times before the pandemic but I think it will be accelerated by uh, these uh, pandemic times because we got experience in in video conferences <laughs> and video contact. Uh, universities make their um, exams uh, in this way. So if this is possible, why shouldn't it be possible to open this way for special, to, to look to restricted uh, uh, documents? That's the one thing. The second is, uh, thank you for the um, example of the psychiatric hospital records. Um, I think it takes us to the way of describe our records for the finding aids. And we, I think we, at the moment, we are discussing in which level is which information. Is in the first information, the first information we put perhaps one day to the internet, is it necessary that the name is in it? Is it necessary that a small village is in it? 
if someone wants to make a research on a subject, it's not for him important who has, if he works on thieves, who has done the theft, where it comes from, but he needs the information that there is an, lots of records of thieves he can uh, use for his research. So perhaps we have, um, all, we have always, until now, put the main um, information in the highest level. Perhaps we have to think of putting names and uh, things which could identify someone put in the second or third level, which is only to be seen in the archive itself. So that were my two points. Virtual reading room will come, will come sooner than we expected. And we have to think of the way to describe our records so that they can uh, disseminate it. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe Dr. Seke for your uh, final reply, if you have some for this uh, question uh, uh, round, or uh, we should uh, go to another question. Please, we please switch, switch on the microphone. We do not hear you. <laughs> I tried to do so, but I was not successful. Now, uh, I suppose you hear me now. Um, so your original question was about de-anonymization or re-identification. That's a problem. But if, uh, if this attempt, which can easily be um, recorded or, or detected, if it uh, is uh, sanctionable by legal terms, like breaking the code of a, of a protected uh, computer program or, or copyrighted, uh, material, if it could be sanctioned, that could be something which would uh, <clears throat> at least um, restrict a part of those people who would like to de-anonymize uh, those uh, data which uh, were anonymized on purpose. Uh, the other thing is that there are new types of archives if we open the discussion to non-traditional, non-public archives new types of archives, like uh, post-custodian archives, where the documents don't go to a certain repository, it remains somewhere else, or community archives. They like to, <clears throat> to preserve important uh, historical or cultural or other documents, or the internet archive itself. Uh, we can, it's a big question whether we can uh, we can regard these, uh, these institutions as archives with uppercase A under the uh, recommendation of the Council of Europe or lowercase archives, meaning the totality of, of the documents, but not an archival institution which is responsible for the documents uh, because uh, the landscape is expanding because of the digital and other reasons. So it's not a clear cut answer, but we should we should uh, deal with these new types of archives, which uh, fall outside of our general legal concepts and uh, technical con technical uh, difficulties or technical risk can be or may be uh, dealt with with some legal um, sanctions or or things like this. But we cannot really really. Um, avoid this in, in the age of artificial intelligence and so on. So let's don't strive for perfect solutions, but we can, we can have legal solutions, we can have concept solutions, we can have practical solutions, ethical solutions, and altogether maybe, maybe we will be able to solve these emerging problems. Do we have some questions uh, from the Blake? Uh, yes, if we could add some from uh, Dr. Šánikova from National Archives of Slovakia. Uh, uh, if uh, she understood well, uh, she understood well. I, I can confirm that uh, that uh, researchers have to prove in Germany that his research interest is uh, uh, has a specific value. Uh, 
uh, or there is entitled to access the the archives, uh, who is um, judging it uh, uh, if uh, these permissions should be granted? So that's maybe a question to Dr. Ram uh, about uh, uh, the role of German archives, uh, as you as you mentioned, and they can uh, they can. Uh, give some permission to the, to the archivist according to some uh, some uh, requests. Okay, I can. Can you hear me? Okay, I, I try to to make it short. The archivists are the institution to decide the access and to decide the supply to uh, improve. But um, I don't. I have to say this is good research and this is bad research or something like this. But one case we have had up to court in a in few instances was that a newspaper asked for a record which was restricted. And I say, okay, you can you have a question and scientific methods. You get it as a researcher and you can afterwards make an um, article on it. But I said, no, we don't subscribe to work with scientific methods. And I say in, in breaks, we want to scandalize this case. And um, I said, okay, for scandalizing, you don't get the record, which is, which is restricted. And they went to court and they, they lost in, in two cases. So we have really the difference and we have got by court the right to decide there is scientific and there is someone with bad uh, intentions uh, to see uh, a restricted law with personal data. We have uh, another question uh, related to uh, ethics of, uh, of uh, access. Uh, that there was uh, uh, sometimes before, uh, sometimes ago, uh, there was uh, uh, under some kind uh, uh, under the historic research, uh, there were uh, accessed uh, data of um, uh, secret services uh, agencies network, and it led to. Uh, some criminalizations, even even murders, maybe in some, some hostile countries. I don't know. Uh, who is responsible for that, and what uh, the, uh, if there if there should be some uh, some closure periods for this maybe archival records? Uh, when we speak about secret services, a hundred years uh, isn't uh, in some cases enough. Yes, maybe it's uh, also related with with some kind of postmortem privacy, but uh, uh, privacy, uh, some responsibility of, for example, children and and others of someone who, for example, cooperated with the with the with the foreign some foreign service. Uh, uh, and um, is archive responsible for that, or is researcher responsible for 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 this misuse of uh, information? Maybe we can comply with the questions that uh, we uh, abolish some closure periods, maybe for. Uh, in, in some uh, cases related to totalitarian times, we are we in Czech Republic has this experience uh, under the, the uh, Nazi and communist regime. So uh, these uh, records are, are accessible without this. Uh, protection, this privacy protection. Uh, maybe it's the also case in in Italy and uh, in in Germany. So uh, and in Hungary, of course. So 
uh, do you remember some cases, some, some tests of uh, private and public interest related to these records of secret service of totalitarian regime in your country? We can start with, with, with Italy, Dr. Barbara. Is, is, there, is there some cases you remember or it influenced this situation somehow, the archival practice in Italy? Uh, not as far as the um, uh, intelligence services uh, of fascist regime. Uh, those documents were made available. Those that were not destroyed <laughs> by the end of World War II, uh, by the, the agencies themselves uh, that destroyed the files concerning the, the uh, intelligence agents. Uh, but that's another matter. Uh, but um, uh, no, we didn't have problems concerning uh, intelligence uh, records of the fascist area. Uh, but um, otherwise, for the um, uh, democratic period, uh, in general, the uh, documents concerning relationships between uh, intelligence agencies of one country with other intelligence agencies of other countries are always the most protected by under all the international legislations because intelligence agencies um, um, need to be considered reliable by other intelligence agencies. So if they disclose documents, if a, if a country disclosed document information that received from another country, it runs the risk of not, no longer being considered reliable, no longer co receiving cooperation by other agencies. So for example, uh, uh, there was clearly, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's quite well known, it's an open secret that um, U.S. intelligence interfered uh, uh, in Italian elections uh, after World War II in order to favor uh, Christian Democratic Party. But those kind of documents regarding the relations were never disclosed either in the U.S. or in Italy. <laughs> so. Um, just, just to give an, an example, mm -hmm. um, uh, then uh, okay, I will leave the floor to other colleagues. Thank you. Dr. Seke, your reply. Yes, thank you. I think that the Secret Service archives, especially the, uh, the former Secret Services before the change of the, the, the system, the lustration archive, so to say, that was this expression was used um, some years ago. These are regulated by specific laws, and, and these documents are kept in specific archives. Uh, so it's not the, <clears throat> the problem of the general archive, general public archives, and the archivist. Um, of course, uh, you can always debate the, the borderline. And when, after so many years, uh, um, after the changing of the system, you may you may ex, uh, expect that everything is open to the public. But of course, people are still living, and this is a very dark uh, chapter of our history of the countries of, of this region. And there's no good solution at all. So people became agents for very different reasons. I don't want to go into detail on this. But if you release something as an archivist or an archive, you release something absolutely uh, lawfully and ethically sound, you are not responsible for misusing this data for other, other purposes. So before you release the data, make it available, make a, a thorough check, but if you release it, you are not responsible. Right. Please, Dr. Rem, okay. uh, your um, reply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can, can approve uh, what uh, Julia Barretta said. It's the same in Germany. Uh, we have no problem with Nazi area documents. Uh, sometimes uh, someone come and say, you have written my grandfather was an ugly Nazi. Um, and he goes to the data protection officer and they say, OK, that historical document, no violation. So we don't have a problem in this case. 
what uh, the international uh, correspondences um, concerns Barbara, uh, Julia Barretta said all the same in Germany, but uh, not really sufficient is a situation uh, concerning the secret services or services uh, in our democratic uh, period. Probably you have all heard of the so-called NSU, uh, National Socialist Underground, uh, which has been, yeah, connection to the Verfassungsschutz in some uh, countries, and they have destroyed records and so on. So we have, I think, the problem with the services uh, in in appraisal and not in access. So, and if uh, we have we haven't solved the problem of appraisal, we don't have to discuss the access if that don't uh, exist uh, documents anymore. So that's our problem, I think. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are approaching to the end of our, of our discussion panel. Maybe if uh, I could ask you to, to give us uh, your message to, to the archives and to, to, the, to the future archives and archivists, a message uh, in one minute speech maybe, or two minutes speech uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a message for, for future archives and future pub public or, and also private uh, archiving. Could you please maybe if we, if we can start with uh, Dr. Uh, Barrera. Uh, well, uh, uh, in a nutshell, I, I would say, don't be suspicious, uh, don't be diffident, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, data protection legislation, because indeed, uh, GD the GDPR, for instance, as already was said by the other speakers, uh, allows uh, for the reconciling of uh, personal data protection and um, archival preservation. Uh, um, and, and then um, I would like to, to uh, um, remind you that there are many uh, different solutions that we can craft to, for instance, reconcile um, um, the promotion of access to archives uh, with the data protection, such as, for instance, when we make available uh, finding aids or documents on our uh, websites uh, to pl place those containing possibly, um, you know, information affecting personal privacy in restricted areas that can be accessed only by uh, users after identifying themselves or also that are protected from a Google search. Because in many cases, you know, the problem uh, is uh, that, um, you know, documents emerge, uh, personal data emerge randomly with random Google search. So something that our um, data protection authority encouraged us to do on many occasions is to, um, um, when we publish uh, uh, finding gates or documents on the internet to protect them from Google search. But still they are on our websites and inside the, our websites they can be searched. So, you know, there are many different strategies uh, on a case by case cases we can see them, you know, to, 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 to reconcile, um, um, you know, promoting access to archives and protecting um, 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 privacy. Thank you. Very much, uh, Dr. Seke. Could I please you uh, and ask you uh, to for your message for future archives? Well, if you look at the four paradigms of archival history, you can see that we are living on the borderline of the global paradigm, which means that users expect universal access to everything, including archives, including. The current information archives that we link in our traditional concept with non-current historical information, but on the internet, so to say, all current, semi-current and non-current historical information are mixed. So the users 
sometimes had no clue how to how to distinguish this. So my message to the archivists: be prepared for be prepared for this situation when your users uh, expect from you everything accessible in their bedrooms. But you need to provide the same safeguards and the same rules in this environment. And, and not everything is yet ready, so please create appropriate tools and, uh, and solutions. And if possible, for the users, my message for the users, don't use Google or Yahoo or Bing or something. If you look for something, use the internal search engine of a trustful archival institution. Because if you Google, you will get hits from, from the world. And sometimes it leads to very different uh, uh, um, uh, considerations. But if you use a trustful institution's internal web website, you will get hits plus context. And that's much better from our point of view, I think. So let's try to convince the users. Dr. Rem, for your final speech. Okay. okay. Thank you, uh, Ivan, for the last sentence. I underline it totally. Um, and uh, in f from as a message to the archivist, correspondence there has a con correspondence to this. First, be aware that you have an important job for the society, for the remembering, for the memory, and for yeah, for showing the responsibility of persons for things which has happened. So that's what we, we always combine with the things of democracy. And, that, and the second is, if you or get or produce as much access as possible, but be aware what can happen. So change perhaps your daily archival processes. First, appraisal is and will be the most important work. Everything which is destroyed can't be used afterwards. And when someone is coming and says, I have been mistreated 50 years ago in a children's home. Then it's an it's a important issue, and we have the task um, to have records in this case. So lots of data protection officers would say, these data from the children's home, personal data, destroy them. No, there are persons afterwards who have need to these records. And the second is, if you describe records, always think of presenting them in the internet and think of what is in, what, what is reconciled with data protection um, things. So which level, which description, that was one of the discussions of last years in, in our administration. And thank you, and there are lots of points which were worth to discuss hours <laughs> longer. Um, but okay, thank you very much for, for the section. Yeah, thank you for uh, all of you for joining us today. We discussed several interesting topics, um, our legislation, uh, some uh, modifications. We discussed public interest tests conducted by the archives. We discussed uh, privacy issues, and there's a lot of more state. We answer the questions uh, in, in, in chat, and some related to the practice in Czech Republic, we will ask them later in the, in the discussion in afternoon section, so don't be afraid. Uh, every answer, uh, every question will be answered. And uh, thank you for, for uh, your thoughts, your time, your energy. Uh, that you shared with us today. I hope we can meet uh, in person, hopefully next year, maybe on some conference like German Archivstag. 
uh, maybe on European Archives Group uh, meeting here in Prague next uh, autumn, or maybe on some other international event, conference, workshops, and others. Uh, so uh, for now, it's uh, our time uh, ran out, and uh, now we will have a lunch break. Uh, let's meet in according to the program in one hour, so I think uh, a half past, half past one, one thirty p.m. Uh, is the time when the next, next session uh, starts. So thank you once more and see you. Welcome back to our today's conference. Welcome back after lunch and after two international sections of our morning part. When we started to talk about the European and international point of view on the topic of personal data protection, protection of personality rights and privacy, especially in the area of archiving. Now let's move to the geographical territory of the Czech Republic, but only partly. And we will also try to be more interdisciplinary in our topic. We will also try to open the perspective into further directions, directions coming to our topic. This will be the perspective of general protection of our data. Mr. Josef will present it. Josef. Mr. Office of Personal Data Protection, Czech Republic. Then the perspective of human rights and fundamental rights protection, the watchdog protection presented by Mr. Jan Vobosil from the NGO Juridicum Remedium, Czech Republic. And then there will be the perspective coming out of the documents and for the records management. The representative here will be especially Tomáš Plochner from the University of Economics in Prague. As the only one he represents the physical part of our hybrid conference. So Mr. Lechner is here with us in the same room as the two of us. We'll be talking about making the archives accessible in connection to the practice and to the file service. We will ask our speakers how they perceive the current tendencies in this right to know in, in the context of the freedom of information in the Czech Republic, also compared to other countries in the Central Europe, or whether this information also has a broader international perspective. Do the countries go in direction to more transparency and openness, or can we observe a another trend? And what do our speakers perceive? Does a person have the right to be forgotten? Does a politician have the same right to be forgotten? Do the public uh, have the right to know what the salaries the politicians have? Did Charles IV, the Roman emperor, did he have the right to conceal his almost fatal injury that he suffered during a nightship battle? and? At that time, he ordered this to be kept confidential. And at that time, he almost lost his possibility to move as a consequence of the injury. A person as a subject in the data archiving, does a person have the right to ask for erasing his or her documents? So these are the basic questions which I use to open the discussion. And I have one additional question to that. Do you think that at the European and Czech nation level that there is a good balance between the protection of personality rights, privacy and personal data 
the right to be forgotten, on the other hand, the right to know, free access to information, the right of memory in the file service, document administration, and as part of archiving in the public interest. First, I would like to give the floor to the person sitting here in the same room, which is Mr. Tomasz Lechner, and then we will move to the online sphere. Okay, so what I should uh, answer from the point of view of document administration, I think that here the rules have been set up currently in a relatively balanced way. I think there is not much pressure to go otherwise, to go to any of the directions, other directions, and I perceive the problem in this context. When I talk from the cross-border point of view, one thing is the setup of the rights, whether we think that the rights are balanced at the levels, and the other thing is how these rights are then really implemented, what is the practice, and what does it really look like? And that's where we can see a great disbalance, given on the one hand by big differences in the volume of process data and file services of different sources, and from the point of view of the scope of personal data being processed, and also from the point of view of the individual approach and particular appraisal of the approach to personal data protection and to the file services as such. Because from the point of view of person data protection and in the context of the file service, it's important always to know what I have, what I register, what I administer. And we are getting to the fact uh, what is the quality of this file records. And we get to the point where there is the overlap of personal data protection and the quality of the, of the filing service. And in what quality these tools are used? And by these tools, I mean, for example, the last one, which is compulsory as the register, the uh, name register. And here we can see quite a lot of differences in which extent such an index of names or register of names is used and whether it fulfills its role. I think that some gaps and overlaps that we should discuss are to be found in the practice, that's from my view. And I would give the floor to Mr. Josef Prokesh. Greetings to the online virtual world. Good afternoon, thank you, many greetings to the listeners. To what the previous speaker said, I would like also to follow up on the morning sections where we could hear about some models of personal data protection and about very practical models of personal data protection. I wanted to address you with the idea and vision that the morning block also mentioned a little bit. And this is a question whether in the Czech Republic everything is presented well. You, we could hear how detailed the such terms are defined, like inspecting, publishing, the terms of communication, dissemination. So these are terms that laypersons are not so much interested in, but people and professionals working with information and with documents should be interested in them. We should clarify these terms also in context of personal data protection. And another thing is, I'm far from saying that everything is okay, but 
It followed from the morning discussions that data protection in the GDPR is general, and as it is set up in the GDPR, it gives huge possibilities and a perspective to be developed. The protection of data was not aimed at closing the society, but the aim was to implement it then and work on that in the individual segment. The sector of archiving has many possibilities regulated, and it was quoted also in such things like the right to be forgotten. I really like the term uh, right, to, uh, right to erasure. But I will come to that later. We also talked about the code of conduct. There are large methodologies of procedures and practice that help us to be able to implement those rules of data protection, which are at the background of our daily practices, like archiving, shredding, operational things, uh, guidelines for the person data protection, because the uh, directive as such does not help, because you need to have it in the particular regulations for your work. So for the researcher or somebody who sees archives and archiving work for the first uh, time, such a code of conduct is a useful thing. That would be in form of introduction, and I'm ready to talk about all these things in more detail. Thank you. Thank you for introductory words. And now I give the floor to Mr. Jan Vobotel. Dobrý den, já děkuji za pozvání. Já jsem tady v takové trošku dvojí roli, nebo mám takové dva pohledy na tu věc. Na jednu stranu, že to je vlastně reprezentuji organizaci, která je to vlastně that uh, has some data protection. I've been cooperating with this organization for several years. So we are trying to talk about the right to privacy and to emphasize this and to emphasize such cases when the right of privacy is violated. And on the other hand, I'm here as a person who studied social history and economic, and I have experience in working with the archives, albeit I worked with the 19th century mostly, where there was no conflict with personal data protection. But I have understanding for researchers trying to get some information, to acquire information, to work with the information very legitimately as part of the freedom of research and freedom of information dissemination. So that's my double point of view. And the conflict that has been mentioned several times Times, even in the morning part, it's the A and Z, the Alpha and Omega, not only of this workshop, but of the archiving work as such, which means privacy protection versus protection of research and free access to information. In terms of legislation setup, I think it's been mentioned already, I do not see any significant problems. I think that the legislation is set up well, but then it depends on its implementation in the practice. Many of these problems require individual solution. It requires that the person deciding about the setting up the processes is aware of the purposes of the interests and that such person then decides about which interests should be involved. And we have many forms of making the archiving materials accessible, not only publishing or not publishing, but there are forms of limiting the publication or registering the researcher, etc. With the development of technologies, there is 
uh, jenom tady tím, že zveřejňování archiválí na internetu je in internet, úplně jiný způsob dopadu potenciálního 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 because it's such a risk of de-anonymization that we are not able to foresee all those computing possibilities for the future. It may change also the possibility of using artificial intelligence. And more and more often we encounter cases in our practice when the anonymization was done in such a way that was really not sufficient and subsequently the data were de-anonymized. I will mention two of these cases, two cases that we also awarded with our Big Brother Award. The first case is from 2011. It was about data from the population census, the Czech Statistical Office then provided an Excel sheet including 10.7 million of rows, which means every citizen had its own row. The names were removed, there was only the year of birth, and there was not an exact address, but 95% of these rows, rows were unique. So in combination with some other pieces of information, we could really see it, and using such a sheet we could get to, you could get to information that really was not anonymous. Tohle považuji za velké This is what I think is a big risk. Anyone working on anonymization should be aware of these possibilities. And I think the only anonymization that we can do is a form of using aggregate data when you have no unique rows, no unique data. In our example, the company Avast, we awarded this because they were selling data from of their customers through their subsidiary. And these were data presented as anonymous data, but subsequently we could see that uh, using them in combination with the data that such companies have, so then it would be possible to make de-anonymization following and identify the individual persons. So these are two Problems. And I think it is very important to talk about these cases when speaking the area of archiving work. Thank you for your introductory words. I think that we got in media's rest. The second question, and uh, I would like to also connected to your words. The question is, which tools can be useful and functional in practice, implementable for the protection of uh, personal data, personal rights and privacy in public, in public administration, in the filing service and activation in the public interest? So in which way should we implement into the document archiving and uh, filing service, how should we implement the principle of minimizing of data? Should this, should some anonymization of pseudonymization of data, could this be useful? For example, in Australia, recently, especially for these documents of population census, so they were really strictly anonymizing before giving it to the archive. So now they introduced the possibility for the citizens to decide, and if the citizen decides and gives a consent, then their data can be. Uh, deposited in a time capsule for 99 years, so it's not accessible for anyone. So this is one of the examples of minimization of data. For example, by using this sort of temporary right to be forgotten, where a little bit exaggerated the right to be forgotten in this sense 
the access is made impossible for a certain time, so it's not even for the needs of some authority, it's not even for the needs of court. So I would like to open this topic. How and which tools do we have? Which tools are functional? for the protection of personal data in the filing services and archiving. And which processes and tools do you see as missing that we should implement in our practice for the filing services, live filing services, and also as part of archiving in the public interest? And I will start with Dr. Lechner, if I may. Oh, it's quite difficult to be the first one to speak. In terms of the tools, if we hear such question, the pseudonymization and anonymizing tools are the first thing that comes to our mind, and I would like to come back what we heard in the morning, I liked in the individual sections because we heard a lot about categorization. And I have this general experience in personal data protection. Some risk which I see there is a global solution which might lead to simplification and of omitting the individual cases and individual solutions. I mentioned that already in the first question when I said that depending on the size of the source of the one who leads this filing service. And I think that some aim of this categorization might help because let's be open. If we should evaluate each individual thing in a deep detail, then we might get into some non-functional state where we will have no sufficiently qualified people to be able to assess that and to decide about what is okay, what is sufficient, what is not sufficient in the given cases. So we probably will have to introduce some sort of typization and some tools for categorization and for access to some categorization. It might be the way to help us. And I think that this is underestimated. It's been underestimated so far. The categorization, even if we can see it in the filing services, some document and shredding plan. There is a plan the length, the duration of depositing such documents, but it sometimes can be a problem to choose properly and to set it up because the plans are sometimes set up for the particular users who are to implement it and it's in an incomprehensible way. So we need some comprehensible categorization. This, I think, might be the tool that I think would help us in this area. And it's not here yet, although there are some things, some signs, it's nothing completely new, it's just uh, the approach. And I liked a lot when I heard from one colleague that we really need to work on that. Uh, really, that's it. We need to work on that so that the categorization is really based on practice so that it is uh, not something too general or too simplifying. At this occasion, I would like to give the, world, give the word to the floor to Mr. Prokesh. And then I will come back to the notice of Mr. Lechner that, that the next time he will not be the first one to answer our questions. Definitely, categorization is a good starting point. We only need to adjust then the terms of the personal data terms. Minimizing is a principle that we apply for all the stages of processing. But here it is crucial to divide what is desirable, what we want to archive. There will be always some higher interest some overwhelming public interest and the risks in the sensitive data will not be so large that the 
political representation will release it and will decide that such things should be archived. To be concrete, I do not want to talk about cases from the Second World War or the war in the former Yugoslavia where there were quite a good cases of using archives. But in the Czech Republic we have experience with two quite unique archives. They are, these are for the purposes of statics, statistics education. We dealt with the Data Protection Office, was dealing with education, and we had heard the argument of the Institute collecting data, which were not anonymous, as Mr. Bobozil was talking about that, for data with a single purpose, to be presented as data for Brussels. So I think there were quite solid archives and databases created for statisticians for the purposes, but this was not a good way, or at least I think the Czech protocols by the Office of Personal Data Protection showed this was not a good way. The other way that the Constitutional Court confirmed was the way of the health information system, something administered by the so-called OOSIS, the Institute for Health Information. This is about a huge amount of data. We got to the argument of the Constitutional Court. The court was very brief in commenting it. The work on categorization here was not done. It's not only about dividing the data according to the nature. nature. It's also about tools, materials, systems that we connect and that give us in the internet environment and in the environment of electronic processing give us a higher added value. What you would spend years on looking it takes now only a few minutes and a few clicks. In the healthcare, a system created an archive of performances for the health insurance companies, and this is an e-government for healthcare. Sometimes you look for tools for safeguards, and roles are being divided, several stages are being divided so that everyone can have the word to categorize and identify the risk. So we know from the area of e-government that the authorities do not know anything, that there are some books and lists, that there are some basic registers. But in the healthcare, this all is on one pile in one institution under one responsibility. And I think from the future point of view, this may be really dangerous. And I feel sorry that the Constitutional Court did not devote its time to this. This is a guideline for me to make a flat solution, a one solution for classic archiving work, because it's really good to find one solution which would not burden the practice, practice the agenda of the archivists. Some of you may know that I'm a big critic of those paper consent to processing of personal data and red tape connected. But on the other hand, we cannot describe everything through the laws. We also need to let some free space. There, as I said, there should always be some safeguards at the level of some methodologies or a code of conduct that uh, all would adhere to that would uh, cover two strict passages of law. So from my point of view, the minimizing will be done first on the political legislation level, where the society will find consensus that uh, this data should be stored and there would be no European Hitler to misuse these things. The other thing is how to apply not only minimization, but also other principles of personal data protection when managing the storing and how are we going to do it with our everyday handling of the offense when inspecting the documents. So these are then practical tools and conditions. 
Nebavím se tady, nebo nechci příliš jako akcentovat to právo na výmaz, the right of erasure, the right to be forgotten, because minimization and other principles of personal data protection are inherent parts of our lives, and we should include them in our procedures and methodologies. I know it is hard in an electronic world. Some of us need to catch up with these things, and we are confronted with reality. We all know in the physical world what locks means, what great means if you fence something. So in the electronic world, this is something new. A laptop or a mobile is a black box. So it's all the more important to introduce such procedures, not to have some special direction for the protection of personal data, but to know that the procedure rules stipulates the most important things. As well as in the past, I knew that if some person comes to inspect a document just to look at it, or if someone comes with a camera and wants to photograph it, so I had to be prepared for this new tool. The right to be forgotten. I think this is a Anachronism. I rather like to talk about the right to erasure, because this is one of the rights of people. If there is no other interest prevailing, that they have to suffer. The higher interests can be here for certain parts of public sector and so for archiving. This is not something that we should deal with in our everyday business. I think that this can be solved at latest at a level of a law, of an act, and having some legislational justification. It's quite an exceptional thing when such cases come for, to a court. So data protection has many aspects. I'm glad if we work on those parts of the personal data protection in the new regulations, the target should be to burden, not to burden our everyday practice. It's very absurd if such an archivist should go through the GDPR to every time to solve some extraordinary situation that happens without having a category of archiving documents, without knowing according to which guideline he or she should proceed. I think this would be ideal. We have done a lot for these things. It was not done at the legislation level. That's a specificity of the Czech Republic. We are now catching up some things. I'm glad that uh, there were findings of the Constitution Court and how the archivists approached them, that they really picked up those pieces of the mosaic which are crucial for the future. So, I'm ending with categorization. And I'm asking in which stage and when can we expect it? I think the basics for the re-evaluation of the existing legislation, which is also a remnant of the let's call it a consent period of the Czech Republic. So I think this should be reviewed and reassessed, and I believe that I will live to see it. Thank you. Then I'm giving the floor to Mr. Vobozil. More or less, I agree with both speakers, some sort of categorization of the individual groups of archiving materials that would be a good way, which archiving documents we are going to store, choosing them, some possibilities to make these archival documents accessible, 
svému can be made accessible to a limited group of persons, for example, after signing some con- consents of agreeing with certain methods of work with them or potential publishing of the information. So there are several alternatives. With the archival documents containing personal data, the data subjects, the living persons, these concerns, we should find some effective system to involve these data subjects into the process of discussion deciding about what should happen with these archival documents. Nakonec i třeba v těch, v těch in, in archiválích vzniklých z činností bezpečnostních složek, který vlastně rozhodoval za komunistického režimu, který rozhodoval ústavní soud, tak ty prostě neobsahují jenom, jenom informace o jednoznačných hrdinech a jednoznačných věcí, které v podstatě mít prostě různé kombinované role, ale myslím, že bez nějakého individuálního vzniku prostě ta situace nevyřeší nebo tohle situace nějak se vyřeší a myslím, že bez lengthy, it may take a long time but without some joint decision we cannot solve all the individual situations. Thank you. I would like to ask when we talk about categorization, because it's a topic where everyone can feel that this is the future for some effective way of processing these data or these archival documents and making them accessible for research. This, uh, as you called it, the consent period is not uh, sort of ideal choice. So I would like to ask directly, you mentioned the example, the case that led to the Big Brother Award 2011, and we are coming back to, uh, we are coming the other way in the round. Population consensus was made according to the law, and after three years, the data or the census operators should be then anonymized and should be given to the state archive to be stored, which happened after lengthy negotiations between the National Archive, the Office for Personal Data Protection, and the Czech Statistical Office. So the conclusion or the compromise that was found, uh, then, then there was a check from the Office of Personal Data Protection in the National Archive, and this inspection said that everything was okay. But this Excel sheet that uh, we didn't acquire at all, it was also mentioned in the media, so the Excel sheet was given to research centers, demographic research centers, Academy of Sciences, etc. And that's why I would like to ask, because we talked about issues like health care registers or health care research. So these are things that we nowadays see that Abroad, there is new gen legislation being established. This research has been acquiring special rights in the Scandinavian countries, etc. Do you see a way for a declared, informed scientific research? It uh, mustn't be only the research that we have, a person entering the uh, research room. It can be also a biomedicine company requiring such data, data because they want to use them for some research. So can you see here for these research institutions some possibility for future legislation adjustment that 
could make part of this data accessible, the data which include not only personal data, but also sensitive data. So what should be the mechanism? Who should decide about such exemptions? Should it be the archives? Or do you think we would need some some sort of uh, legitimate, sufficiently legitimate from the legislation, or do you see some other maneuvering space that would include this public debate and cooperation more with the sources, etc.? So this is uh, where I would like to go in the direction to Mr. Vobozil again, because that would uh, be a follow-up to the issues that uh, he talked about the population census or medical records for some research purposes. Uh, yes, I can very well imagine that, uh, you know, this could be a way of um, how to uh, making more valuable data accessible to a restricted group of people. What I consider to be absolutely crucial is transparency. So going back to the census, in 2011, yeah, uh, the authority couldn't know there would be this Excel spreadsheet, couldn't know who would have access to it, who would work with it, how the data could be secured, etc., etc. So I really see this as a fundamental issue. And then the how the can Protection. Uh, so, uh, for instance, um, uh, the um, uh, Health Information and Statistics Institute uh, um, administers uh, very sensitive data, and uh, the, the ruling uh, is unfortunate. Negative uh, comments. Uh, 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 are process there that could be pseudonymized or uh, anonymized, and uh, actually uh, uh, the registered can be uh, maintained using birth codes, etc., and uh, naturally the register would then decide who would have access to the data, how uh, you know, the data would be provided, etc., so I believe that this is a big stumbling block that transparency of the processes is non-existent. And that was already at the time when the legislation was being put together. We could criticize uh, the whole process, like why the institutions should get the data, and there is just a general provision there. Uh, Often, we really have uh, multiple experiences when we have to, for instance, have a uh, year long, uh, many years uh, long uh, court trials when we uh, really sue them for providing information they are unwilling to. Okay, thank you very much. That's an interesting perspective. And can we have the Data uh, Protection Institute perspective? Mr. Vobotel started on a great note. Census, um, uh, the previous census, I mean, uh, indeed is an example of how things shouldn't be done. It doesn't seem as conciliatory as you presented it that uh, and it is then found consensus. No, I believe that it was really mocked up and uh, that at the very last moment without any justification, analysis, impact assessment, uh, data protection, impact assess assessment, etc. Uh, basically, manipulation started uh, with um, the uh, analyzation of records uh, in electronic form, and uh, when 
data uh, are uh, then benchmarked, uh, we can actually have managed to get personal data out of the anonymized data in 60% of cases. So we need to presume such cases already in the legislative process. So that census wasn't a good example. It uh, was just a course Patrick for a problem created by those who had forgotten uh, everything about data protection and practical aspects of things. Close a look at our case. Už k tomu dochází, protože co se týče medicínských výzkumů, tak my jsme zatím vlastně v Evropě pod tlakem nějakých globálních praktik, kdy vlastně se reaguje i trošku zpětně na, na, na nějaké metody obrovských klinických studií a snažíme se přirovnat k těm pravidlům, právním zásadám a životním zvykům, které, které tady máme. Jak jsem říkal, Evropa je nastavená na takovou, takovou větší předvídavost a možná i větší strnulost. Prostě není tam systém or to have more foreseeable, uh, rigid processes. It's not the US opt-out. Like if you don't want to be part of the system, you can just opt out easily. In Europe, uh, we've always searched for guarantees and rules in advance so that we would know what track will be on and what uh, rules would be followed. GDPR is a great example of that. Zatím právě nevím, že by to bylo skrze protože buď jsou ta archivní data nebo data ve zdravotnictví archivována nějakým zvláštním způsobem, věnují klinickým studiím. Samozřejmě, uh, uh, počítat s tím, že tady jsou dneska registrovány firmy na monitoring úředních desek a dokáží porovnávat data lidí, kteří studují, data can be connected online about people who study, who are single, who are building a house and data can be extracted from that. So, uh, actually, even that data can be moved to archives, but uh, at this stage, it's a separate track, and we're somehow trying to have this uh, anchored in special legal regulations. But if you perhaps put me around and say that it's already happening, I, I don't think so. But for instance, archives would serve pharmaceutical companies directly uh, with the data. Well, as for extracting data, uh, zdá se, že ta data nemají, mají jinou hodnotu, než se zdá a nějakou větší citlivost. Um, se, a lot of response that it would generate and uh, it's sensitive data, special category of data and we need to treat it accordingly. From my point of view, jsme byli v rámci východní Evropy ve a střední Evropě. Eastern, well, Central and pardon, Eastern European countries have been an exemption because we had this extra experience with sensitive data due to the Naopak se to prostě hledalo jako, jako zvláštní výjimky. Když se vlastně podíváte in, in i na obecné nařízení, to vám dává, dává možnost u obyčejných údajů. Máte široký prostor, veřejná zpráva i archivnictví, ale ještě zvláště pojednána prostě sekce 
těhle, těhle dat uh, citlivých kapacit. Obecně, pokud so, přesníte, tak, tak to můžeme... That's my general response. If you would specify your question more, I can... Uh, then I answer, but I wanted to just make a few remarks about the census, which from my point of view wasn't done well. And I also wanted to můžeme prostě v tom souhrnu obecném zvládnout takové citlivé kategorie nebo zvláštní kategorie osobních údajů. Já jsem teda příznivcem, jak nejsem příznivcem z časopisů, myslím si, že by ochrana měla zavřít život a někde bychom měli čekat, až proběhnou nějaké procedury podle pravidel ochrany osobních údajů. To by prostě mělo běžet samozpádem. Tak tady u těchto zvláštních kategorií naopak jsem příznivec toho, aby, aby ty zvláštní úpravy byly a aby v podstatě tam byl opačný, aby, aby tam hledali nějaké výjimky a nějaké extra záruky. Většinou se to extra záruka, to není výjimka, ale, ale že se prostě posílí buď ten režim, režim výběru, nebo režim uchovávání, anebo režim kontroly těch, kteří potom s těmi daty pracují. Čili potom je tam prostě nějaké nějaká procedura, kdy se to dá nějakým způsobem čekovat. Úplně si nejsem jistý tím, jak je zahrnut do toho člověk. Většinou, pokud je něco ve veřejném sektoru, in the public sector is stipulated by law, then we have to suffer the effects of that, succumb to the effects of that legislation. So, well, there is, for instance, this humorous situation that is řeší epidemie. Well, je to pro mě they are dealing with the epidemic in a very weird manner and uh, it makes me wonder what na, na demokracii, že lidé mají na výběr. Někdy prostě stačí ta, ta přesná pravidla, stačí to dobré posouzení dopadů do, do legislativní situaci, vlastně nemám takovou odbornost, aby well, to případ I'm not an expert on your field, but uh, let me give you an lay example. It's just like the open car banální záležitost o tom, abyste mohli jezdit po Praze městskou dopravou. Ne, přesto tady někteří vyšívali na, na souhlasu a když jsme si pořizovali ty tikety, tak jsme byli zahrnutí dokonce formulářem v obrovském souhlasu. A prostě ta společnost byla částí právníků a expertů svedena na, na, na cestí, protože pokud rozhodli zdraví Jasné, uh, requesting all sorts of data. However, common sense should tell us that public transport shouldn't be subject to this excessive bureaucracy, but it happened nevertheless. And uh, it took a long time uh, before it uh, was solved. And uh, let me say that, well, this is an example for me that shows that unless we think about the practical goal, the underlying purpose of a system, that we can then be flooded by various red tape burdens. So I believe that having a comprehensible explanation for the people is more important. It would require uh, public consultation, public debate, um, and uh, for instance, patient organizations should have a say about various things. Uh, I believe that 
jako the jedna z mála neměla ani ani v jednotlivých sektorech. A já bych si prostě přál, aby, um, aby shouldn't be lagging behind in addressing uh, various questions. So we should we should get to the level of uh, other member states that when for instance a topic is debated uh, uh, various committees and the chamber of deputies can have a say it's not that everybody who feels knowledgeable on the subject can have a say uh, we should involve different stakeholders in archiving you've also mentioned that uh, it would be sad if you just held the data and they were enthused by the public so it's vital to involve the general public and uh, the expert public but we really need to somehow make sure that uh, the effects of the legislation of all the people we are concluding one phase uh, one phase that originated uh, approaching the public and asking it what data uh, from registers are available we knew that there was a big mix with that crime perpetrated by the Ministry of the Interior, that uh, citizens' data were sold to private companies in the 90s, so a black market was established by that act. Uh, we approached people uh, asking them whether they have an issue with the data in public space and what issues they have. We got various feedback from various people so for instance one owner of a security company who pays taxes works hard and never had a dad and he was really irritated that once every say three months he has to deal with issues that not only is he in the public register, well, yes, that is the case, but then he uh, is harmed by uh, outdated data in public space. Often uh, uh, he presented the data as, as though they were from a company's register or where, but it's not the case. And, uh, ten paušální uh, právní titul, že uh, co je jednou zveřejněné, lze vždycky, uh, vždycky použít. Uh, ono se to již ukazuje a tím, tím končím, protože... Mr. Well, 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 let me end here. I don't want to take up too much time here. It seems that a lot of data that are positive today hmm, obtain a negative value. There is a neutral face and then a negative face, but then as context is lost, then, uh, you know, it's not enough that it was, say, absorbed from or uploaded from a certain database or registered. It doesn't suffice. And, uh, definitely, uh, definitely, without a context, uh, uh, there is indeed a lot of uh, data in the space and the aim of archiving is to maintain order in information not that we dictate anything to people but we'd like to lead them somehow we don't want to be overburdened by uh, say this information noise and uh, well, we indeed need to somehow categorize the data, the instruments, what implications there are in the public, what means are the most suitable for handling, what, what path we take so that the service is suitable and beneficial to people so that there are as few high-risk situations as possible. I do apologize that I spoke for too long. But I've tried to explain and describe 
some legislative issues, for instance, uh, the botched uh, census of 2011. No, it's no longer uh, the case. Now there are m much more responsible people involved in census. Naturally, uh, when a different data processing method is taken up, we know that, for instance, there are uh, PCs uh, that uh, do the encryption, etc. However, uh, DNA manipulation is the highest security risk nowadays. Uh, there, uh, you know, are other risks out there that society at large will need to consider and will uh, need to uh, adjust our day-to-day -day practice to that. But let me perhaps stop here and ask colleagues from archiving to be more cautious if somebody approaches you and offers you some bright new electronic world, how to make something accessible to the public. It shouldn't be just about making your life and work easier. No, it's not just about the right to be forgotten about data minimization. It's about a whole range of comprehensive protection and uh, risk analysis, safeguards that need to be analyzed. It's up to us as experts who should have a say about how the codes of conduct, etc., are prepared. We need to say it out loud that problems uh, could occur here. So I always say, let's try it out on a small sample. In the West, uh, it, it's very common to do a pilot test phase. In the Czech Republic, this isn't used widely. And institutions in the Czech Republic, as opposed to foreign, and it is do not even have tools to allow for such a piloting phase in germany again you know the permitting letter it can be a permitting letter that defines uh, conditions and rules under which a project may be implemented well i do apologize that i spoke for too long uh, but thanks, uh, you know, to Mr. Vobotil for inspiring me. I had to say it all at once. Thank you. Uh, no, no, let me uh, let me uh, add a few words before I hand over to Mr. Lechner. Uh, we uh, actually um, had a workshop last year that we held in conjunction with the Faculty of Law of Charles University. Uh, then uh, this June, we had uh, a joint project with uh, the Faculty of Arts of Masaryk University in Brno. Uh, one question was selecting uh, archives and biomedicine information and the value of it. Uh, we showed examples um, uh, when, uh, for instance, like data uh, would be given from electronic uh, systems uh, administering uh, medical documentation or health registers. Um, so it's something that is done as part of e-health and e-archiving at the European infrastructure level. Uh, it's held within the European Connecting Europe Facility EC project. So. We know this also from practice abroad that, for instance, biomedical medical information is one of the fields that uh, are made accessible for scientific and research purposes. Uh, then there is a Norwegian Health Archives project uh, that takes care of the medical records of the Norwegian population to be able to come up with some long-term set of data and documents that can help to address various research questions of the future. But I'm very happy that we can jointly uh, agree that, uh, for instance, uh, 
uh, that issue can be opened uh, and to public debate, you know, how to assess the private uh, public interest in the Czech Republic. Uh, we may need some legislative changes um, uh, to address all these questions, but I shouldn't forget Tomáš Lechner here, and perhaps he could um, uh, respond from the perspective of um, uh, a scientist uh, active at the University of Economics, and he can tell us whether uh, researchers can obtain preferential access to personal or sensitive data, if he can address that question from the perspective not just of biomedical data and historical research, but also social sciences, economic research and other perspectives, if this is one of the ways of how to satisfy one of the categories uh, that's forgotten nowadays in our legislation. Thank you very much. Well, I was taking very many notes, so let me uh, make um, the following statement. So, uh, I don't really have much to say about the medical records and information, because this is not um, even in uh, the filing service. It's highly specific. And if I can... Uh, speak about research, well, it's always a question of the purpose uh, of the, the given uh, research. I outlined uh, that uh, already, that we can't generalize, uh, you know, that there is research done at this or that level, there is this or that data. In a specific case, I can always say that this or that research has this and that purpose, works with this or that data has the safeguards, uh, etc. Uh, so we always need to judge it case by case. We can't uh, over generalize here. So naturally, uh, researchers may have a broader idea uh, of what can be researched if the data could be more specific or more extensive, etc., because then it would be possible to make perhaps uh, more interesting calculations, uh, etc. Uh, as uh, you know, mentioned on the example of the unfortunate census and the Excel spreadsheet that was available uh, broadly. But um, you know, I'm moving to the sphere of the filing service, and in the filing service, uh, what is addressed is the uh, current purpose of documents, uh, and what's forgotten is that over time another purpose may arrive and another meaning may arrive. Yeah, that um, uh, archiving has a more retrospective perspective. It uh, Draws data from the filing service needs to uh, take those data in, on board as well. But in the filing service in general, there is a predominant gap uh, that follows from the documentary mode of filing. Uh, that it's put into the filing room. It's like this black. Uh, box somewhere that lives its individual life and we are not interested in it anymore. However, the gradual digitization has interconnected these two worlds, uh, joined them together, and I believe that it is something that those who uh, work with the filing service on a daily basis, we don't realize that this um, interlinkage has already occurred. Um, so, um, naturally, um, uh, there are the shredding uh, uh, deadlines, um, etc., and the um, uh, foresee, uh, foreseeing that we've touched upon sometimes tends to be forgotten and tends to be covert. So, there is um, room for education here. So, archivists should educate. Uh, the individual entities, 
And also some data because this interconnection of the two worlds uh, is sometimes to the detriment of things. And sometimes um, very similar issues are addressed in duplication. Uh, for instance, when we, uh, for instance, get access to files, uh, we have to be ready for situations. Somebody comes with a sheet of paper and a camera. Uh, how do we deal with that? So when, for instance, um, uh, a document uh, that's in well, documentary form is looked at, can we, for instance, cover a part of it with sensitive data, etc.? So how do we deal with that? Perhaps um, uh, there is room for cooperation here. I am in favor of interdisciplinary approaches when there is cooperation from various fields. And uh, we can, for instance, create anonymized uh, variants. Um, uh, so it's not. Uh, you know, perhaps I'm not using uh, precise words, but. Uh, uh, you know, there uh, could be some link between that and archiving, what variants could be sought uh, for uh, having various degrees of documents to be accessed according to purpose, place, and uh, how, uh, for instance, you can also supervise um, the counterpart. In the online space, we don't know uh, who uh, will use the data that's uh, made public. If you make the data public openly, it's beyond our control. So we have to foresee. Foreseeing is vital. Uh, it's, it's vital uh, to know um, all the situations that may potentially occur. Thanks to all three speakers, and let's proceed a bit further. We have two questions from the audience, from the online virtual audience, and let's connect this with one of the questions that we've prepared for you. The question that we've prepared is related to testing public interest uh, from the authors um, in the filing service when documents are made available uh, to the public. Uh, and to let me connect this with the two questions. One is from Pavel Holov, a colleague of mine, who asks uh, the following question, and this is also related to the morning session that we had. How should we uh, separate the public and private life of a person and uh, also with respect to the territorial uh, level or global level? And for instance, persons who would like to be elected in local government uh, should certain information from their private life be made available, accessible to others, you know, they enter public life, but only in a limited space. And then Mr. Michal Yakel asks, how can we distinguish public individuals from private ones? Uh, naturally, there could be, uh, for instance, um, some uh, research showing that history uh, reveals that somebody, uh, for instance, enters public life uh, for uh, a brief while. So let me follow up and say the following. So we need to, you know, test public interest. How we do, do we do that? And uh, that relates to what uh, Mr. Lechner spoke about changing the purpose of processing development over time. It was also mentioned in the, 
Foreign Panels, uh, Dr. Rem mentioned this uh, time aspect and changes uh, that are relevant in data protection. So, in that context, uh, let me uh, speak about Schutzwürdige Belange, uh, protected interests of people that are not limited uh, in time, that also affect post mortem personality protection. So, how in you know the uh, filing service and archiving how uh, can we apply the testing of public interest in those fears so let's start with mr vobotil and uh, then perhaps Mr. Brokish and Lechner can take the question as well well let me uh, answer this whole range of questions that have been outlined. So how to do the testing when we do um, the DPIA, the proportionality test is performed. So there are several steps in it. Uh, we evaluate the legitimacy of purpose, uh, alternatives uh, of how to uh, actually achieve the purpose without uh, an intense uh, 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 intervention, uh, whether the information should be provided, should not be provided, or whether it should be provided in different manners. So, you know, it's like a standardized legal test, so to speak, in which um, uh, values of the entity that performs it are anchored. It's not fortunate, it's probably just necessary, but it may cause some problems because the decision making practice is perhaps then not uniform uh, in respective archives. And as for who is a public individual whose interests should be taken into consideration, primarily I believe that uh, we need to take a look at whether the person is still alive or not. So, when the person is deceased, um, yeah, his or her interests uh, in privacy protection do not need to be taken into consideration. Uh, and, uh, uh, for instance, uh, there is no issue if it concerns, for instance, a medieval figure or something. So, you know, where the problems lie would be living persons who have human rights, who have privacy rights, etc. So, here, I would indeed take into consideration to what extent they themselves have contributed to becoming uh, public uh, individuals or individuals in public interest. So it's not just like to what extent the person is known, but for instance, like to what extent you decide that you want to be or would be known. So you decide whether you want to run for, um, for instance, uh, presidency or whatever. Uh, and if you have um, certain health disability naturally that may also be in public interest but then you haven't contributed to having this disability it just complicates your life so that you know naturally given that situation uh, we should protect the person's privacy even though people would like to know uh, everything about that person with the given specific disability but then if you have regional and national politicians uh, it's a different situation in some regional politicians I would uh, believe that it's acceptable to have some public control whether there are some local interests for instance the person that may not be but I mean it may not be adequate to discuss certain issues at national level but in the internet era it doesn't really matter whether there's an article in a local paper or in national paper if it's an interesting piece of information then it undoubtedly will uh, appear at the higher level anyway so so much from my side perhaps I've forgotten some aspects but I can 
add those later on. Thank you very much. And let's hand over to Mr. Prokesh now. Well, this theme is extremely broad. Well, public interest is an indefinite legal term. It's not a neologism, though. The issue that we have with it is that we should sensitively approach given situations and we should know how to uh, take decisions uh, uh, well accordingly uh, we or I have always had an issue with the proportionality tests that would certainly lead to identifying the justified interest that they could be done at local level. Well, it's the same as though a frontline officer was to do them or an archivist was to do them if a specific request was filed with him or her. I've always said that justified interest should be foreseen in a certain way and there should be a legal regulation that would be adequate. This has been distorted by the brutal onset of technology when people started using uh, uh, the internet and other means, well, now everybody's a prophet, uh, uh, can use the internet um, as, um, you know, the mountain or hill that he or she stands on and, uh, you know, trumpets news out to people. So we really should think about for what purpose we uh, provide data to others. There can be banal and complicated cases. I've always tried to recommend the analogy principle. So uh, naturally, there are principles applied to written documents and uh, naturally also in electronic documents. We can make use of similarities and cross-cutting issues. Many things are interdisciplinary. Uh, for instance, um, making wages public. Uh, this is a very nice example. Well, you've mentioned uh, that you know wages of uh, top public uh, policymakers, well, that is an issue, but I must say that uh, it has become really politicized here to make this public. And there have been many uh, debates about that, even in small municipalities. It can be a problem, uh, really, and I must say that uh, clearly um, there would be identification of that person in the small municipality because, you know, that, for instance, one lady would do everything in that given municipality and would be identifiable. Uh, and I must say that uh, uh, we have agreed that we should apply the analogy principle in life and in law and that there is the conflict of interest act which is very good it uh, defines who um, uh, should uh, actually uh, follow and who has to observe the transparency principle. Sometimes we need to set the boundaries. Naturally, not everybody likes that, but uh, um, naturally we need to uh, make certain 
disclosures and for instance at the Ministry of the Interior uh, there was a civil servant deciding about uh, amounts in you know in millions so naturally the tra transparency conditions would apply to that person and then there is yet another category of people who um, actually never dealt with that, their uh, wage, uh, their influence and position and public interest uh, is uh, negligible, minimal that is, and uh, naturally the law doesn't apply to them. We have come up with a stance, a position, we wanted to address these issues. Uh, and, uh, well, sometimes um, uh, the wages uh, of individuals were requested, but then sometimes these weren't relevant requests. Sometimes, you know, Things are, uh, you know, addressed and they should be in rem and not of personam. But anyway, that was the Ministry of the Interior and then there was the Supreme Administrative Court ruling which uh, has enlightened uh, the issue of financial flows in the public sector. So that was this rather unfortunate ruling and new clashes uh, and skirmishes started as a result of that because of this ruling. So based on could identify what's essential, what not. So, you know, it's good to have a guidance in that respect and be able to take decisions. So, an anarchy unfolded, everybody was forced to do the proportionality test to see that um, it's something that works in conflict of interest doesn't then work in disclosing wages. I think this is an unfortunate situation and I think that this is a momentum and a lesson learned for us because it may have been sufficient to communicate better. After the verdict, these things were withdrawn, our joint opinion, we were also trying to adjust, but then we had to step back and then the constitutional court had to decide. I think that this is a memento for us not to behave in this way, not to approach things in this way. And it's also a personal memento for me not to rely on these tests of proportionality very glad for these studies, for these research methods. It's not true that this is something that the clerks have to work on if there is some project that there is a personal data protection. Is There are university studies, hundreds of pages that provide some support, some methodological support and fundament how to tackle these things. I'm not able to say that in interest it can be uh, approached uh, as a flat thing. It must be individual. Then, whether it's a set of data from some building permit procedure or some voluntary activities of a uh, an association, or whether this is data concerning particular persons. It hasn't been the topic of discussion in the public, unlike salaries. Salaries were discussed, some companies were penalizing it if uh, such things were discussed. I think this is good if uh, yeah, so discussions are. There was a huge disproportion of things, of people that will have impact on 
activities in the public, like journalists and some other pseudo-active people who do not fall under this category. And there are also people who, from the point of view of clashes of interests, were never, have never been suspicious, and their data shouldn't be released. For me, the most peculiar case that's also a little bit distant from archiving, but I have several examples from actual practice, like, uh, unlike what to do with data. So the most peculiar thing was that there were some authorities and state prosecution released complete lists of their employees. I think this is a security risk endangering this country when every criminal then can read how much a secretary at a given division takes, uh, how much, how high is their salary. So then it's then they can just go there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm just ending as a threatening case, and I hope that in the archiving such cases will not appear. Thank you. So, in the end, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Lechner. And at the same time, I'll join it with the last question that I would like to ask. I have the same question, our foreign panelists. Could each of you then spend one minute in telling us some message, some challenge or some, a sort of message for future archivists and filing services and document administration. So within one minute, please. And at the same time, a very little question for Mr. Lechner, if you could join it into this minute or two minutes message. And the question for Mr. Lechner is, the filing service do we talk about their permanent interest and the overlap into archiving. What would you change in the daily practice of these public institutions? I didn't understand the question. There's a question from the Academy of Sciences. So if you just could answer this question and join it with the required message, if you want some time to think about that, we can do it the other way around, the answering round, but I think you can manage. Okay, so first I would like to finish my answer to the previous question because I think that uh, it has been rounded up quite nicely by talking about the tests of proportionality. These tests of proportionality and testing of public interest, it cannot be done individually by each archivist, by each clerk on the counter. These are things that, on the one hand, should be solved individually, of course, and I mentioned and emphasized it several times, but we are getting back to what we already said, which is a need for categorization and setting up the categorization. And I think that this can help a lot so that it is granular enough so that we do not gen over generalize. But we also need to have it sort of approachable, or we need to capture it somehow. And this granularity, I think, is more important than balancing some other parts. Because I think that setting up the useful methodologies can help a lot in our practice. So that would be to the previous question. And now I'm not sure whether I should answer the question to the purpose and filing service. I think that this is a way of long-term education. The connection that the electronic filing service is brought in the filing service and connecting with the fact that these are the data that remain, that there is no uh, boundary between the filing service and then further archiving, but that everything is interconnected and it's based on this data. So it's something which is, has been new for 10 or 15 years from the point of development of the filing service and from the point of view of uh, way of thinking in the 
all the area it's quite a short time and i also met such uh, uh, opinions that we have had electronic signature for 20 years so everyone must already know how to do it but i think these things need time and in this case i think 20 years is just like from one day to another i think that still we need some time because it takes time to get it all into practice and just to imagine that everyone will be able to do it from overnight. So I think 10 years is a short time because these general principles of finance emergency have been with us for a much longer time. And 10 years is a very short time. We cannot do it all. So it's important not to give up. It's important to go on and to put this education or teaching. The education is important. And like this, we need to continue. And I would use it, this could also be this message for the future. That was quite nice. Thank you very much. Now I'm giving the floor to Mr. Vobotil. I wish for the archivists in conclusion. I would like to follow on what Mr. Prokes said. What definitely helps are high quality methodologies for categorization that will enable to avoid some complicated deciding about matters where it can be done. There are also cases where it is not possible to do it, so then I wish you a lot of patience and uh, understanding for the points of view of those researchers and for those who are the subject of articles, or subjects of the personal data who do want people not to know anything about them. So I wish them a lot of patience for finding a solution which would balance both these legitimate interests. And finally, we didn't mention the aspect of the researchers. Not only in the archives there is the duty to solve all this position, this obligation to solve the situation. It's also up to the archivists, and I'm not sure that enough attention is devoted to it during their education, working with archival documents, with sources. So I think that that would also be needed. There is potential to improve so that historians also know more about the work, proper work with archival documents. Thank you very much. And last minute for Mr. Brokes. We really have only one minute. I talked for a long time, so three things I would like to wish to the archivists, responsible and knowledgeable researchers. Secondly, less legislation addendums. The more addendums it would mean uh, complications for the resort under the pressure of authorization or others. And thirdly, please remember, as Mr. Obeshek says, it's always better face-to-face -face than interface. Bear that in mind, because we have many false prophets of digitalization. Electronics and digitalization is not only a good thing, but it can also be like a knife or like a car. It can serve a good purpose, but you can also use it for committing a crime. So these three wishes or messages, that's all. And thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank all the speakers for the fruitful discussion, for their ideas and opinions that may further resonate and we will take the ideas on, we will try to accentuate these ideas to make our work efficient. And I would like to emphasize categorization methodologies and with that I would like to invite you to our last panel, which will also include some suggestions for personal data protection the data protection impact assessment. This is one of the abbreviations that we will hear a lot about in the last panel. So 
Stay with us, and after a short break of 10 minutes, we will start again. Quarter past three. So, see you. Good afternoon. Welcome to our last panel of our conference. It's a panel devoted to two methodologies that are currently being created in the Czech archiving area, in particular as part of our research project that we work on as part of security research on behalf of the Minister of the Interior. Two of my colleagues will speak. They are present here in our hall. It's Mrs. Marketa Munkova who is the Deputy Director of the State Regional Archive in Prague, and she is one of the few uh, lawyers that work in this area in the Czech countries. And next to her we have Mrs. Karolina Šimunková, again one of the few archiver lawyers or lawyers working in the area of archives, and she is, she is the main methodologist in the National Archive of the Czech Republic, and she's been cooperating, both of them have been cooperating with the Department of Archiving and Filing Service of the Ministry of Interior as the body for archiving in the Czech Republic. In this context, the context I must apologize, Mr. Yildi Ulovets, the director of the filing services, who couldn't unfortunately be here because of uh, work duties, but I think these two colleagues will provide provide enough inspirational information in this area. And now I would like to give the floor to our two colleagues, first uh, to Mrs. Munkova, to introduce the methodologies that are currently being established as part of this research project of the Ministry of the Interior. Good afternoon. With my contribution, I would like to introduce the possibilities or the duties of the protection of personal data in archives and what are the consequences of their violation. So it may be a little formal lawyer's point of view of these issues, but it's connected with my focus, with my work. The starting points that I have been considering. First, we are in the sphere of personal data in archival documents and their protection. There is an institution. This institution is usually the archives, usually a public archives. This has a scope of competences given by the law and resulting duties. These are certain borders within which the archivists work. This scope of competences is being done through the employees, the archivists, starting with the 1st of January 2015, also through the state employees according to the Act on State Service. Archive as the administrative body, but also the individual employees have responsibility for the proper uh, performance of their competencies or to fulfill the duties that are given by the law. With uh, performing their activities, performing archiving activities, they also deal with personal data of living persons. There are two groups in which we identified this dealing with personal data. One area is purely archiving activities. The second one is rather operational, like working in the uh, research room, etc. So in this rather operational area, there are mostly uh, handling with documents, it's the phase of working with documents, and in the purely archival activities, that's usually working with archival documents. The list of activities that are given by law or stipulated by law, and it's practically the 
scope of competencies, scope of duties done by the employees. It's, for example, selecting archival materials in shredding procedures, registering the documentation, processing fonts, making the archival documents accessible, or also checking the activities, and etc. Subject of protection. The subject of protection is a subject, is the carrier of personal data. And it's the, <coughs> the person whose data has been given to the archive, or the archive is processing, and whose data are in the archive documents. I would like to talk about two basic principles that this protection in the archives is being performed. One basic protection for the subject whose personal data are at stake is the confidentiality duty stipulated by law. This is more connected to the area of the operational activities. Another important area is the so-called DPIA, which is the Data Protection Impact Assessment. And I would say that this is uh, more relevant for the archivists, for the purely archiving activities like making the archive documents accessible. The confidentiality duty is related to the physical person or natural person. There are, few. There are some theories, some definitions of this uh, confidentiality duty. Alex Brecha says, that generally the confidentiality duty can be defined as a legal institute with the basics of the duty of the natural persons to keep in private as well as authority contact such rules of conduct which ensure the protection of particular information and data on citizens. This first definition only talks about natural persons who are the subject or the data subject. Further definitions then talk about not only protecting the data of natural persons. The confidentiality duty is considered to be one of the basic instruments to protect the citizens against unlawful illegitimate use of information that concerns them. This confidentiality duty includes, or does not include only to keep the information secret, but also not to make them accessible, not to disclose them. So, for example, to lock the documents, not to let them freely lie somewhere on the table. It's not only the protection of natural persons, but also subjects of public law, controlled persons, parties in proceedings. The subject is bound as a natural person because they are obliged to protect information during their expert administrative or other activities. It means also during private life. As I said already, this protection is not only applied to natural persons, but also to legal persons. So this other definition that I found in the small lawyer encyclopedia written by a group of authors says that, or takes it as a broader definition and says that this duty of confidentiality or non-disclosure duty is also for the protection of interest of public as, well as private natural as well as legal natural persons and legal entities. Violating the duty of non-disclosure, it can be done by acting or also non-acting or omitting. Acting means some active part that leads to disclosure, making accessible or publishing the protected facts. For example, if, you, if somebody tells information to a citizen of the municipality who then will tell such data from a control 
uh, proceedings or from some list, although he was not a party. An example of not acting or omitting is leaving documents without any supervision lying on the table somewhere, uh, including sensitive personal data, or forgetting such documents somewhere in a restaurant or on a train. There's also a judgment from the Supreme Court that stipulates a situation of a policeman who left documents containing information subject to non-disclosure duty near a third party, and a third person got to these documents when the policeman turned his back. So this omission, this non-acting, is also a violation of this duty this non-disclosure duty, in which cases we can break this non-disclosure duty. First case is a situation when you, there is the, the information goes to the person whose information is being included in the document or to his or her lawyer. It's, it's uh, maybe, it's, for example, inspection of the looking at the file or providing information according to the Information Act or it's a release from the duty by the body or by the institution according to which kind of non-disclosure duty it is, which acts stipulate the non-disclosure duty. It's the act on state service. We all who are under the Service Act must adhere to it. We are state employees. The Act on Processing of Personal Data. It's also given by the GDPR, and the non-disclosure duty is also stipulated by the Act on Archiving. It's given in the Administrative Procedure Code or in the Control Code. To the non-disclosure duty, I would sum up three basic things. First, it's connected to a particular person, to the employee. Then, another important piece of information, it remains even after the end of work relationship. But I think this is very important to say that it should only last for such a time when it is necessary to provide these, to provide protection to the protected facts. The the duties of archivists are uh, also include this non-disclosure duty. The other important role in the protection is fulfilled by the so-called DPIA. It's given in Article 35 of GDPR, and this Article 35 of GDPI imposes the processors, the administrators of personal data to assess the impact of planned operation of processing of personal data on their protection. Those administrators are archives. And the, then we talk about the uh, archives and assessing the impact. This is a sort of a consideration about and how the activity of the control and of the archive will impact the sphere of the subject data and whether and how the personal data of living persons will be dealt with. When I thought about that, I was thinking to myself that we can divided to the big DPIA and small DPIA. This big DPIA, that was an attempt as part of the first methodology. It will be part of our project. Basically, it's been processed for all archives and it will have two forms. One form will be a ready impact assessment at, on the date of finishing this methodology, and the other form will be a sort of template DPIA, a form for assessing the impact for future usage for the case that there would be some be some change 
change or way of processing. The small DPIA is a term for situations where the archivist, as part of their daily work, make some assessment, some consideration as to how to proceed properly in relationship to protection of personal data of living persons that are mentioned in the archival documents. The aim of DPIA is, according to Article 35 of GDPR, that the controller of the personal data, it means the archives that is planning to start processing new personal data or some significant change of the existing procedure, assesses properly the impact of the operations on the protection of personal data. So the purpose of this assessment is to assess whether the prepared ways or prepared changes are creating or strengthening the risk for the data subjects. When fulfilling the duties of archiving activities, violations can occur. Such violations will have various intensity and it will be variously binding in each individual case, so it must be assessed individually. There are three forms of uh, violation according to their severance, and we can talk about minor violation, major and serious violation of duties. For the minor violation, such a minor violation of duties can be a change or some non-acting, small non-acting that requires correction. In our DPIA, where we identified some risk activities, I chose those activities which I think would be considered as minor violation, like a long-term non-acting of the archive during the process of choosing archival document, documents containing personal or sensitive data, or some unacceptable conditions when taking care of archival documents in protocol, or incorrect identification of personal or sensitive personal data in the protocol on shredding procedure. Major violation, which requires some correction or some review of process setting up of proper rules. And the response to such acting must be already more visible. And it's also necessary to, that it leads to some consequences. It can be, for example, not preparing some protocol on handover or its non-submission not giving over concerning archival documents with personal data. It can be a loss of uh, some information. And the most serious violation of uh, duties, there is the assumption, I think, that firstly, this requires immediate correction, immediate uh, corrective measures, and also some preventive measures, and uh, bringing the person to responsibility. It can be, for example, illegitimate provision of information about a person initiated some proceedings, or making archival documents accessible that include sensitive data or data on living persons when there is no exception under Section 37, 11 of the Act 499-2004, or some loss of, uh, uh, loss of documents or not preserving documents. These violations of duties of archivists that may occur, of course, only rare cases, can lead to a harm of uh, the rights of 
actual persons, legal entities, or state. But towards the outer part, it's always the institution which is responsible. It means the Czech Republic would be sued in the party to the proceeding archive. Responsibility of a natural person that violated his or her duties. That's given by the Archiving Act. This is given in Section 73. This presumes the delict of the employee of the natural person in violating the disclosure duty. The natural person as the employee of the uh, authority and other employees will commit this by violating the non disclosure duty according to section fourteen. So consequence concerning the non disclosure duty. The responsibility liability of natural persons is given by the Labour Code. Or the consequences of violating are stipulated in the Labour Code. So employee can face the ending of its labor relationship or it's also under the Act on Act on State Service. This would mean disciplinary procedure and also a compensation of damage would be according to the Labour Code. Liability for such violation of duty is also stipulated by the Civil Code. Civil Code stipulates that the liability of the natural person violating the duty could mean violating the law, violating the contract, or being in breach of good morals. And I'd consequence that mentioned today, but I didn't hear that any such case would really happen in archiving. There is the section 180 of the penal code which presupposes or which stipulates illegitimate handling of personal data. And that would be the section used against some employee that employee who would cause such a serious harm that could be specified as serious in the sense of the penal code. I think that this would be the end of my contribution. I, give, I will give my, the floor to Carolina, but I would like to say that it's always necessary to proceed carefully to protect the rights of persons while being uh, maximum open and be friendly as archive. Thank you for it. Allow me to take the floor, if I may. Thank you. Uh, the presentation has already been uploaded, so let me start straight away. And uh, then, in the conclusion, I'd like to respond to the uh, previous session uh, because we definitely need to touch upon some uh, things mentioned there, but uh, now, really, I'll do that after my full presentation. I'll speak about uh, the small DPIA, uh, the launch has been mentioned by my colleague already. So uh, the DPIA should also be one of the outcomes and outputs of the project, uh, working uh, with archival files. So, you know, the DPIA has this structure that you can see in front of you. Uh, the introductory chapter discusses uh, the basic terms, then uh, there uh, are archival files, documents containing personal data in the Czech Republic and risk assessment. 
Uh, then uh, it is um, acquisition of uh, archival materials and files containing personal data and then process of minimization of personal data uh, during the selection and processing. Uh, minimization is a term that follows from the GDPR. Then uh, there is the uh, impact of the purpose um, uh, of um, uh, uh, actually uh, looking in uh, the files and impact on personal data protection. Last month, not least, uh, duty not to disclose anonymization in both analog and electronic form, including practical examples, and uh, then a list of legal regulations uh, on this, which the methodology is based. I have already outlined um, previously at previous workshops that we have some issues with definitions. Uh, well, it was raised also in the panel with uh, foreign participants that, uh, you know, there is blurred, blurred boundary between personal data and um, personal sensitive data. Uh, our national legislation works with these terms differently than the European uh, regulation. We need to come to terms with that for sure. Um, address that somehow. And then uh, there is the issue of medical data. Uh, we only use personal sensitive data. There is no term such as medical secret uh, or something like that. Uh, then uh, uh, actually we should take a look at anonymization and pseudonymization. Uh, there are some definitions there, but the practical processes um, are quite hard. Uh, it's hard to say which uh, is taking place, whether anonymization or pseudonymization, that it's genetic data and data about uh, somebody's health um, and others. What is interesting for archivists, and let me follow up on the previous speakers who have called for a solution addressed at uh, specific archives, documents. Uh, so we should find some subsets of files with specific issues and uh, relate personal data protection to that. We have strived to do exactly that. And well, let me follow up on my morning contribution where I showed uh, which of the archives last year took part in the survey that we organized. For the purpose of the analysis and the methodology, it's crystal clear that we don't need to address personal data protection in all files because a large part of the archive, archive documents are not documents that would even contain personal data of living persons. A large part uh, is beyond that problem. So we have you know, against this backdrop, uh, strive to come up with a parameter uh, with which we would identify relevant files. We've used two cross criteria, the criterion of time and content or nature of the archive file. So here you can see the table that we've come up with. And let me tell you how it could work. Well, risk assessment is the result of combination of these two factors and only after uh, these two parameters are put together can we evaluate whether the personal data uh, or whether the file contains a high or low or medium risk with respect to personal data rather. So how is it? So through the methodology, we'd like to implement 
something that uh, our legal regulations are not familiar with, but foreign ones are familiar with, and that is to determine some timeline from the um, creation of the documents, uh, so deadline for uh, finishing uh, data protection. So we'd like to introduce a um, 100-year closure period uh, that we would use in the comparative model and risk assessment. So documents up to the age of 1918 would be considered as uh, archive documents without any risks, then there would be low risk documents where it's hard to seek a boundary because for sure we can, for instance, have the cutoff with the end of the Second World War, but then some of the categories end in 1945, but there are some overlaps there. So some of the archive files, uh, for instance, are up to 1949 and 51 even. But for the sake of the time parameter, even these files could well fall in the low risk category. Then there would be medium risk. Uh, files and that is those um, that uh, were established between 1949 and 1990. So there would be some minor oscillations for sure, but uh, a major part uh, would meet this parameter, so it could be used, and then would be high risk archive files with respect to the time factor and those would be um, documents files established after 1990 again with some exemptions there then the evaluation according to content and nature of the file is as following so uh, there could be various uh, newspaper clippings uh, that uh, have no risk whatsoever, or it can be, for instance, land registry data uh, and uh, various uh, uh, collections uh, such as genealogy uh, collections, etc., with um, their number codes. Then there would be low risk uh, archive files. So the dominant part would be archive documents without any personal or sensitive data, or if these are present, then only randomly and rarely. Uh, then we would have uh, archive files uh, with medium risk. So it would be those files where personal and sensitive data are present, but they are not a dominant part of that. So. It would be, for instance, uh, uh, HR files uh, easily identifiable, um, and a parameter can be created for its identification or looking into that. Then there would be high risk archive files. So that would be documents with structured personal sensitive data. The predominant entity of the file would be information tied to an individual. So that would be non-anonymized uh, census documents uh, or medical records, other medical documentation, from healthcare facilities, etc., police records, uh, court um, agenda uh, tied to specific individuals, prison files uh, and records, uh, uh, the register of um, uh, birth, weddings and deaths, etc. So that is a major risk, a high risk. The two parameters, the content and time factor, then meet in this table. Um, uh, and based on comparing and, you know, basically you know, benchmarking them, we establish whether there is either zero up to high risk. 
applicable in a given case. Uh, we pursue uh, this evaluation uh, in our archives, so it's um, in accordance with the code numbers, uh, the uh, you know, the files are placed in thematic groups, uh, so the risk assessment can serve as a mini DPIA. Um, the archives either are happy with this output or uh, if not, then based on the outputs that they can adjust their internal regulation or handling uh, high-risk archive files, in particular when processing, uh, processing them. Another part of the methodology is dedicated to individual processes related to the acquisition, um, uh, processing and providing access to uh, documents. Uh, also, what do you do when shredding um, comes into play? How do you handle personal data there? Uh, I believe that uh, after long years, our legal regulation is not insufficient. We are just uh, not fully applying what the regulations state, state or what the GDPR states. So we'd like to focus on personal data uh, in that respect also during acquisition. Uh, so archivists should focus on whether uh, the archive documents have been obtained uh, illicitly or in accordance with law. And uh, are these documents meant for permanent placement in archives? How do we deal with uh, certain illicit nature of certain documents that we may encounter? The length of shredding periods also needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, the shredding lines should be reasonable so that uh, uh, the deadlines wouldn't be unreasonably prolonged. We can, uh, for instance, use um, an exemption that some of the documents may be archived permanently. However, uh, uh, we can, you know, with respect to these documents, uh, archive them only for a reasonable time limit. And one further duty, again, enshrined in legislation, but not really applied in practice extensively, and not everybody knows how to work with it, and that is the duty of the archivist. Uh, to notify that uh, personal data documents are the subject of shredding. Sometimes personal data may be covert and not really apparent during the shredding proceedings. Minimization of personal data uh, uh, during selection and processing of data is yet another issue. Not always uh, is it necessary uh, to um, basically uh, uh, collect and process all personal data uh, without devaluing the information we can minimize personal data that may be the subject of acquisition then minimization may occur also during processing when uh, the archive description is being prepared and then personal data uh, uh, may be uh, also minimized uh, uh, 
when it comes to access, so naturally when it's an archivist or researcher um, and uh, well, digital instruments may be used in a more sophisticated manner in this respect, we should, we should also uh, have directed or controlled access to information based on roles. We need to realize that on the one hand, we can identify our files that uh, may specify uh, access and making those public. On the other hand, there would be researchers accessing information based on some rights and based on roles uh, entrusted to them. So even though we call for a simple solution, simple solutions are not really out there. We can, however, simplify the procedures if we uh, would uh, define uh, the roles of those who uh, approach uh, the files and whether it would be a historian, journalist, or private individual, etc. So we can, for instance, uh, fine tune the parameters and achieve better results if we would just generalize everything. The same applies to uh, minimization. So here, uh, if we look at the purpose of looking into the data. It can be for official or private purposes. Um, uh, and here we always say that it's there is a difference between uh, the two. Sometimes the purpose is misinterpreted. What is scientific access and scientific um, um, uh, look into the archives. So that's uh, one thing. So unfortunately, uh, the current legislation is not really clarified that then there is yet another part dedicated to anonymization in the analog and electronic form. If we anonymize, for research is something that's analogous. There have to be two copies, one that's then, you know, blacked out, and then you have to ha make a copy of this already blacked out copy. And then there are some instructions for how to anonymize in electronic form. Uh, we expect that these instruments would be or should be applicable to digital born documents. That's how I'm getting to the end of my presentation. And I would like to react to the previous speakers. I would like to thank Mr. Prokesh for and uh, for devoting the attention in these difficult times where we must tackle the difficulties. So he would, I would like to thank him for still being with us and providing us with his help. He talked about the risks of digital world and he talked about being careful. The risks of digital world, I think, are known to us and digital world has many pros and many cons. One of the advantages is that it is so technical. So that we must be very careful in setting up the individual roles. And the technical solution leads us to it. It's not as that we would know from our selves that we need to separate between one person in different roles. So this uh, 
is given by the technical solution already where we have to identify the individual persons and describe the individual processes. So even if the risks, if it doesn't occur to us, then it occurs to us at the moment when the technical solution is in front of us and we have to uh, really think about it and uh, make the algorithm of which flow the information will have. So that was just a partial response, but thanks to this uh, notice. We are aware of this individualized approach. And one really small response to the term of uh, the population census that went wrong. The, it was a lot of acquisitions. We have large archival data from the census operates, and the census operates were a source of many inspections. It uh, applies to the 20th century. The archival files from the 21st century are, from the point of view, based on the experience, are priceless, because the form that they were the form in which they came to the archives doesn't really give us any, uh, any information. And uh, based on the experience after the last uh, population census, so based on this experience, we decided not to acquire the information collected through the population census because it would uh, it has no sense to store such information because we cannot get any useful information out of it. So that's my response to the population census. Well, when talking about botched population census, we argumented, we used the arguments from all around the world where they, for example, in the Anglo-Saxon world, they have a very different approach to population census because they do not have the totalitarian experience. They do not have the experience of how such information can be misused. So in this parameter, unfortunately, we have to say that if it is necessary for the future to have some older data that would cover the information about the whole population, then the Czech Republic will not have such data at its disposal for the reasons I stated. Anglo-Saxon countries will have such information, but unfortunately even these arguments that we used when negotiating didn't lead to the target we wanted to achieve, which means having the census operates being stored with full data so that we did it in the whole 20th century. And this would all be all for my part. I'd like to thank both the speakers for their contributions. And I would like to ask one question. And, this, and there is also a question from the audience, from the listeners. Unfortunately, we have a little time. So the question was, to which extent the personal data are protected in the funds of the Communist Party times? The, make, let's make it simple. These archive funds ha, are subject to exemption in our archival law from 2004. So in principle, these archival documents of this fund are open to researchers. I will not uh, go into detail. If I may respond, however, it's important to tell the difference between making accessible and publishing. These funds are accessible to any researcher because there is the exemption from the personal data protection. And this exemption is in accordance with the European regulation because in totalitarian funds it is possible that the individual member states have a varying, a different implementation or regulation. And another thing that was supported by the Constitutional Court fighting the Czech Republic is publishing such data. But according to the finding of the court, this is not possible. So using it in the research room, it is possible to access them without the consent of the public data, but to publish them is not the same thing. Yes, definitely. 
If we got a more detailed question, I would then advise the colleague to uh, address the colleagues from the archives or the data controllers. The second question concerned the handling or the accessibility of documents which are secure or confidential under the investigation services. Here I would like to say that uh, confidentiality information are regulated by a special act on the protection of confidential information. In the Czech Republic, this act stipulates only that the level of confidentiality will be changed after the time needed for that lapsed. And it's stipulated in the act. There is a generally stipulated duty to check whether the reason for making, for keeping the information confidential still remains. This should be reviewed every five years in this terms. The Czech Republic is very friendly towards the investigation services, but I would have uh, a question for both colleagues, whether the Czech archivists, whether they should fear the new methodologies that are prepared, are being prepared, will it be a burden for them or is there no reason to fear because this should be a help, this should make their lives easier? in terms of all those processes when dealing with personal data and all the archive activities. I will start. It's a suggestive question. In both cases, the methodology should be sort of friendly, it should make our lives easier. As I said, the DPIA is processed, it's created for all archives as of the date of its issuing and as of it coming into force. I think this should be a help, should be of assistance, and it will definitely be in the second case. I will let Caroline answer. But I think that in both cases, the methodologies are created, and I shouldn't probably say it aloud, those archives who will not will not be wanting to do anything, they basically will not have no need to because the risk assessment will be done. Some archives will indeed implement some processes for the processing of data and they will deepen, such processes will deepen with digitalization, and I mean digitalization of not only archival documents, but also of the processes. We have electronic evidence, we have describing modules, etc. So here will there will be some impacts, but these are activities that the archivists do anyway. So it's just a question of how to do them correctly for the future. So there is an oscillation between I do not have to do anything urgently up to the possibility that using these methodologies I can use the results for the processes and use them for our for my internal processes, for example, setting up, adjusting some parameters or describing the archival documents and something for the processes which is not contradictory to the existing wording of the rule. So it is the oscillation between doing nothing up to I will take the methodologies and I will use them in such a way that my processes are even better than now. Thank you for your answer. And in the conclusion, I would like to mention that our colleague Peshtyak from the Re Regional Archive in Plzeň sent a question to concerning these documents. So it's writings of political, administrative and social organizations from that time of communist regime. What should we do? What should be our approach to these documents? I would like to add that in principle, with the fund of the Communist Party and with other similar funds, the mentioned applies, which means the individual 
Making it individually accessible in the research rooms is possible because we have this mentioned exemption, Section 37 of the Archiving Act. But the colleague is asking how to determine whether these are still living persons. Yes, that's a problem when processing personal data in, uh, in the archives. And especially in these funds, in these funds that have this exemption, we have an advantage because we do not have to address the issue whether the persons are living or not, in principle, of course, because there are, can be some exceptional situations, but in general. With the other funds which are not subject to this exemption, there we face this problem. And the methodology is the colleagues were talking about that we would like to give to the archival community, which is the aim, should provide some set of instruments and some help as to how to deal with it, how to set up all the processes when handling with personal data, especially in such funds which are not included in the exception or exemption regime and for those funds that include personal data, which means data about living persons. I'm not sure if you want to add. Yes, I would like to add something. Of course, it's true that it's Section 37, Part Paragraph 11. There will be some adjustments made according to the authorization and structure of data, which you can acquire from the registers. But anyway, this stipulation is quite broad. So there are also files which were under the national front. These are associations, are political associations like beekeepers associations, etc. But the public is probably not seeing it such that even here the protection of personal data is broken because it's also funds from the period of communist regime. So the bright the broadness of this exemption. Second thing, how to check if the person is still living. There is no absolute solution that would cover the whole set. We can look at the basic registers, we can get the information from the information system, but that's only part of the set because it's only persons who go through our national registers and then we can get their consent or get the information whether they are living or not. That's the basic or the existing mechanism that I think Mr. Vobodil was mentioning, the opt-out system that we have implemented in the Section 37. Well, then there are persons where we have full personal data, even sensitive data, and when there it is sure that it doesn't go through our national register, so we cannot check it because it can be people living abroad, living in a different member state of the EU. It can be foreign soldiers, foreign students, a very large group. Czechoslovakia provided different uh, stages and possibilities for foreign students to study here. So these are people that do not occur in the national registers and you do not have any guideline how to check them. And the situation at this moment is not possible to solve even if we go through the national registers. We will still have a subset where the solution is not available. Thank you very much. Thank you both for the questions and answers for a very fruitful presentation for acquainting us with what's um, ahead of us, what the future development could be regarding methodology and uh, other um, guidelines. Um, that we may have at a time when it's necessary to achieve um, better information level and uh, assess uh, whether we, you know, how we can make available the modern archives containing 
Personal data with that, let me close today's conference. Thanks to everyone involved actively in our agenda. Thanks for uh, presenting at the conference. And thanks to all of you who have been following us online. Uh, if you had any technical issues, if this broadcasting was not available for a certain period, you won't really lose that part because um, we'll make a recording out of this and make it available shortly. Uh, to all of you, if you've registered, uh, you'll get it via email so you'll be able to watch it online. I'd like to thank everybody who asked questions and were involved in the discussion. We wanted to and did our best to answer all questions. Um, so either in the morning session or uh, in the afternoon, uh, I would like to thank the whole organizing team, all the technical support team. My thanks goes to the interpreters as well, to Daniela Sipko and Kveta Podhajska for interpreting this event. It is certainly not an easy theme. And uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, naturally we uh, have had to uh, somehow come to terms with the uh, aggravated epidemiological situation. We've had to wear respirators uh, at all times, so it uh, indeed made conditions for the interpreters even more difficult. So thank you very much uh, for uh, facilitating communication uh, with uh, our distinguished foreign experts and viewers. I would like to say goodbye to you now. Thanks again most cordially to everyone. I uh, do hope that we'll be able to meet again to discuss the issue of personal data, privacy and other aspects in the archives that um, hopefully uh, we'll meet again. We'll definitely uh, keep um, dealing with that topic going forward. And we wish you uh, a lovely rest of the day. So goodbye from Prague.